My name is Rick, and this happened to me in the spring of 1993. It was the craziest thing, definitely something I won't forget. I'm a truck driver, been hauling cargo for over 20 years now. Seen most of the country, met all kinds of folks. Makes life more interesting, if you asked me. Anyhow, I was on a long haul from California to New York. About halfway through, I decided to stop in this little town in Oklahoma. Can't remember the name. Small place. One of those where everybody knows everyone else. Figured I'd grab a bite and stretch my legs before hitting the road again. I found this diner just off the highway. Looked like a classic spot with red leather booths and a jukebox in the corner. The kind of place you see in old movies. The waitress, a stout woman with a friendly smile, took my order. Burger and fries, nothing fancy. While I waited, I noticed the place was almost empty. Just an old couple in the back corner, and a guy sitting alone at the counter. He was big the kind of broad shoulders that fill up a doorway. Had on a worn-out trucker hat and a faded denim jacket. He didn't turn around, so I couldn't make out his face. But there was something about the way he hunched over his coffee that gave me a strange feeling. Like a prickle on the back of my neck. I finished my meal, paid up and headed back to my truck. The sun was starting to dip low in the sky, casting long shadows across the parking lot. That's when I saw it. Right there by the front fender of my rig, a mess of blood. I mean, a whole lot of it. Fresh, too. My heart skipped a beat. First thought, some poor animal got hit. But then I followed the trail, and it led straight to the back of my trailer. Now, I don't scare easily. But the sight that met my eyes when I swung open those trailer doors turned my stomach. A young woman, probably no older than twenty, was crumpled on the floor. Her clothes were torn, and she was covered in. I don't want to get graphic. It was brutal. She was dead, that much was clear. I froze. My mind raced. Was this some kind of setup? Should I call the police? But then, what if whoever did this was still lurking around? The big guy from the diner popped into my head. I couldn't shake the feeling he had something to do with it. I looked around, but he was nowhere to be seen. Fear kicked in the kind that pumps adrenaline through your veins and makes your instincts take over. I slammed the trailer doors shut and jumped into my truck. I didn't even think about where I was going. I just hit the gas and peeled out of that parking lot. I drove all night, barely stopping for gas or food. My mind replayed the scene over and over, the blood, the girl, that big guy in the diner. Who was he? How did the girl end up in my trailer? Did he see me find her? Was he following me now? The questions swirled in my head, making it hard to concentrate on the road. I started to doubt myself. Maybe I'd imagined the whole thing. Maybe it was an accident, had nothing to do with me. But deep down, I knew something evil had happened back there in Oklahoma. I finally reached a rest stop as the sun peeked over the horizon. Exhausted but unable to sleep, I grabbed a cup of bad coffee from a vending machine and tried to figure out my next move. Going to the police seemed like the right thing to do, but how could I explain how I found the body? Would they believe me, or would they think I was involved? The whole thing could ruin my career, maybe even land me in jail. Panic swelled inside me. I thought about disappearing, changing my name, running off the grid. It seemed like the only way to shake the fear, the memory of that girl's broken body. I wrestled with the decision for what felt like hours. In the end, self-preservation won out. I couldn't risk everything for someone I didn't even know. 
I climbed back in my truck and continued down the highway, heading east. That was the last time I passed through Oklahoma. I put as much distance between myself and that little town as I could, trying to wipe the whole gruesome experience from my mind. It's been years now, but the memory still haunts me. Sometimes I wake up in a cold sweat, the image of that dead girl seared into my brain. I wonder if anyone ever found her, if her family knows what happened to her. I wonder if the guy from the diner got away with murder. Maybe someday I'll work up the courage to go back to the police, to tell them what I saw. But for now, I carry the guilt and the fear like a heavy load on my shoulders. They say time heals all wounds, but some cuts run too deep. My name's Marcus and this happened to me back in 2009. I drive a long-haul rig, crisscrossing this country more times than I can count. It's lonely work, for sure, but you see some amazing things, especially after the sun goes down. I shared the road with a whole different crowd at night. This particular route had been a milk run for a while. Florida oranges up to New England, then an empty trailer back down. Easy peasy, though the pay wasn't great. But hey, at least it kept the wheels turning. That August, I was hauling through the Ozarks, deep in southwest Missouri. Mountain roads, all twists and blind curves, not my favorite, especially in darkness. But it was late, and I was pushing to hit my deadline. I was nearly nodding off when I saw the hitchhiker just off the shoulder. A woman, hunched over, arms wrapped around herself like she was freezing. Now, I don't usually pick up strangers, but there was something about her that nod at me. Maybe it was how out of place she seemed, on that lonely stretch of road in the middle of nowhere. I slowed down, debating. Common sense said to keep driving. But then again, what if she was in real trouble? Might be worth the risk. I pulled over, flipped on the hazards. She approached my truck, and I got my first good look at her. She was older than I'd first thought, maybe late thirties. Her face was gaunt, eyes ringed with dark circles. Thank God, she rasped, her voice barely a whisper. Ride broke down on me miles back. Now, this seemed a little off, but it was late and I was tired didn't have the energy to argue. Get in, I said, unlocking the passenger door. She settled into the seat with a shivering sigh. You're a lifesaver. I was starting to think I'd be spending the night out here. Where you headed? I asked, pulling back onto the highway. Branson, she replied, voice stronger now. Got family there. She didn't elaborate. I didn't ask for details. Honestly, I was half asleep and just wanted to get to the next truck stop. Conversation drifted for a while. Mostly small talk, harmless stuff. But the longer she sat there, the more uneasy I felt. She wasn't giving off any bad vibes, just something was off. I couldn't place my finger on it. Glancing in the passenger mirror, I noticed something. Her clothes were caked in dirt and leaves, like she'd been scrambling through the woods, but I hadn't seen any car nearby. Strange. I decided to make my move. Listen, I got a level with you, no cell reception out here. I got no way to help if you really did have a breakdown. Her shoulders tensed. I... I know. I can walk it from here once the sun's up. My gut twisted. This whole situation was getting weirder by the minute, and I didn't like it. Actually, there's a town ahead. Motel, maybe a diner. We can get you set up there. No, please, she replied, her voice tight. I need to get to Branson. 
Look, I said, keeping my tone steady. We'll get you there eventually, but I gotta get some rest. It ain't safe driving like this. Her eyes darted to the side window, then back to me. Something like panic flashed across her face. I... I understand, she finally mumbled. Good, I thought. We were making progress. I found an exit a few miles ahead and pulled off the highway. The motel was just a sad-looking place with flickering neon lights. But it would do for a few hours. I gave her some cash from my wallet. Enough for a room and a bus ticket come morning. This should see you through till you can catch that ride to Branson. She took the money, mumbled a thanks, and bolted from the truck. I watched her disappear into the motel office. My mind was still buzzing, unable to shake that strange feeling she left me with. Before I could hit the bunk, a noise made me freeze. It was a muffled scream, coming from the motel. And it sounded a lot like my passenger. I jumped out of the truck and ran toward the motel. The door to her room hung half open. I burst in expecting. I don't know what. Maybe an attacker, someone holding her against her will. But the room was empty. No sign of a struggle, no sign of her. The window behind the ratty curtain stood wide open. A wave of confusion washed over me. Had she made a run for it? Why? The more I thought about it, the less sense it made. She'd begged for a ride, desperate for help, yet here she was, sneaking off into the night. Something brushed against my leg. I jumped, then realized it was just a faded motel brochure that must have blown across the floor. It was one of those cheesy tourist things, advertising local attractions. I scanned it absently caves, fishing holes, civil war battlefields, the usual fare for these rural areas. That's when my eyes snagged on a headline. Beware the mountain man. My heart skipped a beat. The article was short, just a few paragraphs warning about a string of unsolved disappearances in the area. Locals whispered of a wild man, living in the woods, preying on unsuspecting travelers. Hikers, drifters, folks who wouldn't be missed. My blood ran cold. I remembered the dirt caked on her clothes, the fear in her eyes when I mentioned driving into town. Was the story about the woman just a cover? A way to get into my truck, lull me into a false sense of security? And then it hit me. I was her next target. Panic surged through me. I had to get out of there. But where to go? The open road, dark and lonely, suddenly seemed just as dangerous as that motel room. That's when I spotted the phone booth just outside the office. Could I get a signal? Maybe call the police, though I wasn't sure what I'd even tell them. I was halfway to the phone when headlights pierced the darkness. A beat-up pickup truck swerved into the motel parking lot and careened to a stop. My breath caught in my throat. The driver's side door swung open. A monstrous figure emerged, built like a linebacker gone to seed. He had a wild, unkempt beard that reached his chest, and his eyes gleamed with a feral intensity beneath a battered camouflage hat. My fear spiked. This was him, the mountain man from the brochure. He spotted me and grinned. It wasn't a friendly grin, more like a predator baring its teeth. Well, what do you know? Looks like dinner delivered itself tonight, he growled, moving towards me with surprising speed for a guy his size. I turned and ran, instincts taking over. The phone booth seemed ages away. My only hope was getting back to my truck, locking myself inside, and praying he couldn't break in. Behind me, I heard his heavy footsteps and foul-smelling breath. He was gaining, closing in fast. I was a few feet from the truck when my foot caught on something in the gravel, 
sending me sprawling to the ground. The force of the fall knocked the wind out of me. I struggled to get back up, but the pain in my ankle was searing. The mountain man was upon me. His meaty hand clamped down on my shoulder, dragging me across the rough pavement. I kicked out wildly, desperate to get free. With a roar, he hauled me up and slammed me against the side of my truck. The impact rattled my teeth. I saw stars, my vision blurred. His hot breath reeked of something rotten. Thought you could get away, did ya? He raised a heavy fist, and I instinctively threw up an arm to shield myself. The blow crashed against my forearm with sickening force. I cried out as something snapped. That was when the police lights flashed across the parking lot. The mountain man froze. I didn't know how anyone found us out here in the middle of nowhere, but I wasn't about to complain. With a frustrated bellow, the mountain man released me and bolted towards the tree lean at the edge of the lot. Two officers sprinted after him, guns drawn. I heard a shout, a single gunshot, then silence. I slumped to the ground, clutching my broken arm, shaking uncontrollability. Everything had happened so fast, too fast to fully comprehend. It felt like a nightmare. The next few days were a blur of pain, police interviews, the long drive home with a cast on my arm and a deep, gnawing fear that would take a lot longer to heal. News reports filled in the blanks. It turned out the woman I'd picked up was named Eliza, and she was his accomplice. Her role was to lure unsuspecting victims to him. They'd been a team for years, preying on those who wouldn't be missed immediately, leaving nothing but fading wanted posters and unsolved cases behind. They told me I was lucky. The mountain man had a history of violence, torture even. Most of his victims were never found. The ones who were, well, the officers said it wasn't a pretty sight. The officer who fired that shot in the parking lot, he saved my life. But the story didn't end there, not really. The police found Eliza a week later, hiding out in a cabin deep in the woods. Turns out she didn't run when I went into the motel room she was waiting, ready to ambush me from behind. The mountain man is still out there, somewhere in those vast Ozark hills. They said they're confident they'll get him eventually, but until then, they advised me not to travel alone through remote areas. I don't think I'll need any convincing on that point. Sometimes, when that old diesel engine drones on and on under the night sky, I remember that woman's haunted eyes, that hulking figure in the darkness and that gunshot ringing out, and I realized how close I came to being just another ghost story whispered along the lonely highways. My name's Walt, and this happened to me back in the fall of 97. I'd been driving trucks for close to three decades. Seen a lot, done a lot, mostly the kind of stuff that had bore the average person to tears. But that year, that was a year that still gives me the shivers. My wife, bless her heart, she hates it when I take those long hauls across the southwest. Says the desert roads have a bad vibe, and with all those news stories about people just vanishing, well, she worries. But sometimes... A job pays too good to pass up. That's how I found myself hauling a trailer full of electronics down through Arizona, with a delivery window that meant driving late. I was cruising down a two-lane stretch of highway, not another soul in sight, when I saw him. A man standing by the side of the road, just a silhouette in the setting sun. Seemed odd. There weren't any towns or even rest stops for miles. Now, I ain't the type to leave someone stranded, but something about this situation didn't sit right. He could have been dangerous. My better judgment kicked in. 
I kept driving, but my eyes stayed fixed on the rearview mirror. Sure enough, the guy started waving his arms frantically, trying to flag me down. I couldn't make out his face from that distance, but he looked tall, with tangled hair that bounced as he jumped around. I swallowed hard. Part of me wanted to hit the gas and disappear into the night. But the other part, the part that always got me in trouble, whispered, Stop! Don't be a heartless jerk! With a groan, I pulled the rig over. The guy ran towards my truck, a wild grin on his face. As he got closer, I realized something wasn't right with his clothes. They were ripped, covered in dirt, as if he'd been fighting his way through the brush. Mister, you're a lifesaver! My car broke down back there. He panted, pointing back towards the way I had come. I raised an eyebrow. Didn't see any car. His grin faltered. Well, it's back a ways. Side of the road. Can you give me a lift into town? Here's where I made my second mistake I agreed. Figured the quickest way to get rid of him was to play along, drop him off at the next gas station, and be on my way. He climbed into the cab, and immediately a foul odor filled the air. He smelled like sweat, something rotten, and something I couldn't quite place, almost like iron. It turned my stomach. Name's Zeke, he said, offering a grimy hand to shake. I hesitated, then took it. His grip was clammy and surprisingly strong. Appreciate the ride, Zeke continued, settling back into the seat. Hate to be stuck out there all night. Those coyotes start howling something fierce. It was then I noticed something in the dim light. His fingernails were chipped, caked with dirt, and was that blood? My pulse quickened. I tried for casual conversation, but my voice sounded strained even to my own ears. Where you headed? Flagstaff, he replied. Sister lives there. Got me a place to stay. Conversation died after that. The tension in the cab was so thick I could practically chew it. With every mile, I grew more convinced I'd made a terrible mistake. This guy wasn't just some unlucky traveler. He was bad news. Finally, we neared the outskirts of Flagstaff. Zeke stirred awake, his eyes glittering with an intensity that sent chills down my spine. Pull over up here, he instructed, pointing to a desolate stretch of road just outside of town. Just need to take a leak. Won't be long. I did as he said, my hands shaking slightly on the wheel. He hopped out and disappeared into the darkness. I stared at the spot where he vanished the hair on the back of my neck standing on end. This whole thing was screaming wrong. I should bolt. Get out of there. I should. And then he was back, lumbering out of the shadows towards the truck. In the dim glow of the dashboard lights, I saw that his hands were empty. That was a relief, until I noticed the fresh blood staining his shirt. It was spattered across his chest, dark and wet in the dim light. A wave of nausea washed over me. I had to get out of there. I jammed the rig into gear. Zeke yelled out in surprise as the truck jolted forward. Hey! Where you going? I ignored him, speeding down the road. That was when I heard the thumping on the roof of the cab. I looked up and saw him there clinging to the top of the trailer like a giant spider. His face was pressed against the small back window, twisted in a rage. He pounded on the glass, screaming, but his words were drowned out by the engine roar. Fear twisted through me like an icy fist. This was insane. I swerved the truck from side to side, trying to dislodge him, but he held on with impossible strength. His wild eyes locked with mine through the window, and a chill ran down my spine that had nothing to do with the desert night air. 
I slammed on the brakes, sending the trailer swaying dangerously. Zeke went tumbling over the top and disappeared from view. I breathed a sigh of relief, then froze as I heard the unmistakable sound of metal scraping against metal. He was climbing back up. My hands trembled on the wheel. This was it. I was about to become some gruesome statistic, one of those missing person stories my wife warned me about. I scanned the cab desperately. Was there anything I could use as a weapon? A tire iron, a wrench, nothing. That's when I saw it, the thermos perched in my cup holder. It was stainless steel, heavy. My only chance. He clawed his way onto the roof, grinning that terrible, blood-smeared grin. As he hauled himself towards the cab, I grabbed the thermos and swum. It hit him square in the temple with a sickening thud. He let out a startled grunt and tumbled off the side of the truck, landing in a heap on the asphalt. Without thinking, I gunned the engine. I wasn't sticking around to confirm whether he was dead or just unconscious. I drove like a madman, only slowing down once I was safely across the state border. Eventually, I pulled off at a truck stop, my legs so weak I could barely stand. I stumbled into the grimy restroom and splashed cold water on my face, trying to shake the image of Zeke's twisted grin from my mind. It was no use. I reported the incident to the police. Described Zeke the best I could, told them everything. They found his body by the highway a few days later. Some wild animal had gotten to him, or so they thought. I never told them about the blood on his shirt, the way his eyes had gleamed with something far more dangerous than any animal instinct. For a while, I was a local hero. Trucker who fended off a crazed attacker, that sort of thing. But I knew the truth. It wasn't heroism. It was pure luck that I had survived the encounter. It was guilt, knowing Zeke had probably done this before, that probably others weren't so lucky. That gnawed at me for months. Things eventually settled back into a routine. Runs, deliveries, endless hours alone on the open road. It was easier to pretend like that night in Arizona had been a nightmare and nothing more. But sometimes, late at night, I'd catch a glimpse of a lone figure hunched over on the roadside. My heart would clench in my chest, and I'd reach for something, anything, to defend myself. One night, months later, the nightmares were particularly bad. I'd woken up sweating, Zeke's face looming over me. I stumbled out of my bunk and headed for the truck stop diner for a bad cup of coffee to calm my nerves. That's when I saw the news bulletin on the flickering TV behind the counter. My stomach dropped. There had been a string of disappearances along southwestern highways. Truckers, hitchhikers, anyone traveling alone. The newscaster listed the names of the missing, and a cold sweat broke out on my skin. One of those names was Zeke. I stood rooted to the spot, a buzzing in my ears. I couldn't fathom how Zeke could still be alive, let alone out there preying on others. But then again, what had gotten into his eyes that night wasn't something that could be so easily killed. The rest of the night was a blur. I don't even remember how I drove back to my truck. The images played on an endless loop in my head, Zeke leering down at me through the back window, his body lying broken on the road, that news report flickering on the TV screen. How do you explain something like that to the police? How do you tell them that the man you hit with a thermos months ago isn't really dead, that he's out there, hunting? They'd lock me up in the psych ward, and maybe that's where I belong. The next morning, I didn't pick up another haul. I drove myself straight home. I told my wife I was done with long hauls, that I'd find a local route. She cried tears of relief and baked me an apple pie. But I knew it wasn't over. 
I knew, somewhere out there on those empty desert roads, Zeke was still waiting. One day, it dawned on me, I'd become his prey. My mind wouldn't let it rest, wouldn't let me forget, even as years passed. And sometimes, even today, when I look over my shoulder, I almost expect to see that bloody, grinning face reflected back at me. The face of the man who wouldn't stay dead. My name's Frank, and this happened to me back in the summer of 99. I've been driving the interstates for close to 25 years, so I've heard all the stories. The roadside diners with poisoned coffee, the hitchhikers who aren't what they seem. Mostly, I laugh them off as trucker folklore, meant to spook the newbies. But that summer, it made me a believer. I was on a cross-country run from California, hauling a load of produce that needed to reach the East Coast before it turned to mush. That meant driving long stretches at night, and I'll admit, sometimes my mind would play tricks on me, especially in those empty desert stretches. It was on one of those nights, somewhere in Nevada, that I saw him. A tall figure, lanky, standing by the side of the road, just illuminated by my headlights. A lot of drivers, they won't stop, and I get why. You hear stories. But, well, I guess I've got a soft spot for those down on their luck. This guy looked desperate, waving his arms, his thin frame hunched against the desert wind. My better judgment told me to keep driving. But that other voice, the one that's always gotten me in trouble, whispered, just give the guy a ride to the next town. I pulled over to the shoulder, and as he approached, I got my first good look at him. He was older than I expected, maybe late fifties, his face weathered and lined. There was something gaunt about him, the way his tattered clothes hung loose on his body. He had a wild, unkempt beard that reached his chest and piercing eyes that seemed to see right through me. Thank you. Bless you, he croaked, hopping into the passenger seat. The inside of the cab smelled musty, of old cigarettes, and something metallic that made my stomach churn. Name's Ezra, the man said, extending a bony hand. The handshake was clammy, unsettling. I pulled away quickly. Where are you headed? I asked, trying to keep my voice neutral. He's he replied. Far east as I can get. Don't matter the town, long as I keep moving dot. He settled back in his seat, and we drove in silence for a while, the only sound the steady hum of the engine. I stole the occasional glance at Ezra, trying to figure him out. He wasn't your typical hitchhiker. There was something off in his eyes, an intensity that put me on edge. As the night wore on, the unease grew. There was a subtle shift in Ezra's demeanor, a predatory gleam to his eyes. The air grew heavy, charged with unspoken tension. I realized, with a chilling certainty, that I'd made a terrible mistake. I started formulating an exit strategy, trying to think of some excuse to stop the truck, kick him out. That's when I felt the pressure against my ribs. Don't even think about it. Ezra hissed, his voice barely a whisper but laced with ice-cold menace. A jolt of adrenaline shot through me. I glanced into the side mirror, but he'd tucked whatever he was holding out of sight. What do you want? I managed to say, my voice shaking. Just cooperation, Ezra replied, a cruel smile creeping across his dirty face. You keep driving, we'll both get where we need to go. Fear not at my insides. I knew he wasn't bluffing. If I made a wrong move, I was a dead man. I started thinking about those missing trucker reports, the faces flashing on the news, alone, isolated, easy prey. The hours blurred together. 
Ezra directed me off the familiar interstate routes, down winding state roads, each mile taking me further into desolate territory. At some point he told me to switch off my headlights, plunging the truck into an inky darkness broken only by the dim glow of the dashboard. I started making desperate calculations in my head. Could I overpower him? Maybe grab the tire iron from under the seat. The thought was quickly crushed. This guy was wiry, but there was a desperation, something feral within him that told me I didn't stand a chance. We came to a stop in the middle of nowhere. Ezra ordered me out of the truck, keeping that unseen weapon pressed against my side. In the moonlight I could see we were in some sort of gravel pit, surrounded by scrub brush and tumbleweeds. What now? I croaked, my voice barely above a whisper. I looked around wildly, hoping for a sign of someone, anyone, who might help. But there was only the desolate emptiness. Now we part ways, Ezra said, a satisfied grin on his face. You walk back to the highway. Might take you a while, but eventually you'll find help. And you? Me? I got business to take care of. He gestured vaguely toward the rear of the truck with a chilling smile. My mind raced. What business? What was in my trailer? My blood ran cold. This wasn't just a robbery. There was something far darker lurking beneath the surface. I glanced back towards the trailer, and a wave of nausea washed over me. Even with the scant moonlight, I could see dark spatters staining the metal. Blood. Don't make this hard, Ezra said, prodding me in the back. Start walking. I did as he said, each step heavy with dread. The farther I got from that truck, the worse the feeling in the pit of my stomach grew. I wanted to run, scream for help, but the fear had me frozen in place. This man, this monster, had a plan, and I'd become part of it, whether I liked it or not. After what felt like an eternity, I saw the faint glow of the highway ahead. Ezra remained a shadowy figure far behind me, watching. I didn't look back until I reached the asphalt, then I ran like I'd never run before. I flagged down the first car that passed. The driver... A friendly-looking older couple stared at me in shock as I rambled, half incoherent, about Ezra, the blood, the danger. The police arrived quickly. I pointed back toward the gravel pit, but when we got there, my truck was gone. Vanished into the desert night along with Ezra, leaving only tire tracks and a lingering stain of blood as evidence. They questioned me for hours. I told them everything, Ezra's unsettling appearance, his controlling demeanor, the way he'd spoken about, taking care of business. But without more evidence, there was little they could do. They sent out a bulletin, a description of my truck, but I knew, deep down, it was futile. The incident haunted me for years. I was lucky to walk away with my life. But the mental scars went deeper. I quit trucking shortly after. Couldn't bear the isolation, the long stretches of highway that suddenly felt like hunting grounds. I took odd jobs around town, anything to avoid being alone. My wife thought I was losing my mind. Nights were the worst. I'd wake in a sweat, replaying those chilling hours with Ezra in my head. Every shadow seemed like his looming form every creak of the house his ragged voice whispering threats. Even during the day, I was constantly on edge, scanning every stranger's face, wondering if those piercing eyes would be staring back at me. The case went cold. The police speculated Ezra was just some drifter or desperate ex-con, likely hopped up on something. But I couldn't shake the feeling there was more to him than met the eye. His calculated ruthlessness, the cold gleam in his eyes, that wasn't the desperation of an addict looking for a quick fix. 
it was something far more sinister. Then the news reports started cropping up. Truckers disappearing along remote routes all across the country. The descriptions matched Ezra, tall, lanky, weathered face hidden behind a wild, unkempt beard. It was too similar to be a coincidence. Ezra was still out there, preying on unsuspecting victims. And that's when the guilt hit me with full force. How many others had I condemned to a gruesome fate by not fighting back in that gravel pit? Had they left behind worried families like mine? It was a burden I carried, a constant reminder of my brush with evil and my complicit inaction. To numb the pain, the fear, I turned to the bottle. It eased the nightmares for a while, but at a terrible cost. My wife left, a once happy home dissolving into arguments and whiskey-soaked evenings. I hit rock bottom, lost my odd jobs, and drifted from couch to couch. One rainy night, I found myself on a park bench, the half-empty bottle my only companion. A police car pulled up. The officer who emerged looked vaguely familiar. Frank, he said, his voice hesitant. Squinting through the rain, I made out the uniform, the name tag. It was the same officer who had taken my statement all those years ago. I braced myself for a lecture, but instead he just offered me a sad smile. There's news about your case. About Ezra. My heart pounded in my chest. You found him? The officer hesitated. We think so. He fished in his pocket, pulling out something grimy and worn. Found this while investigating a string of disappearances. It was a faded trucker's cap. My trucker's cap. There was no need for him to explain further. A chill ran down my spine. Ezra was likely dead, but somehow, knowing his reign of terror was over provided little comfort. The officer offered me a ride to a shelter. I accepted numbly. In the back seat of the police car, I realized it wasn't Ezra's death that haunted me the most. It was knowing what he represented, the darkness lurking on the edges of society, the fragility of our safety, and the chilling realization that monsters walk among us, sometimes cloaked in the most unassuming of faces. I had gotten a second chance at life, but the scars of my experience would never fully heal, serving as a grim reminder of that desolate night I encountered pure evil on an empty stretch of highway. My name's Marcus, and this happened to me back in 2012. I've been driving the long-haul routes for close to 15 years now, and I've seen my share of weird stuff out on the road. But nothing, and I mean nothing, could have prepared me for that summer on the back roads of Oklahoma. I usually stick to the interstates faster, safer, more predictable. But sometimes a job takes you off the beaten track, and this one led me through the Oklahoma boonies miles of rolling hills and sleepy towns that seemed frozen in time. It was late, well past midnight. The nearest town was a good fifty miles behind me, and I was starting to think I should find a place to pull over for the night. It wasn't just the fatigue either. Something about those endless cornfields, bathed in moonlight, just creeped me out. And then I saw her, standing right on the edge of the road. A woman, all alone, in a white dress that shimmered in the glow of my headlights. She had her back to me, her dark hair cascading down to her waist. Now common sense told me to keep driving. There's a reason truckers call those lonely stretches. Lot lizard territory. And picking up a random woman seemed like a recipe for trouble. But the truth is, I was lonely. Days on the road by yourself can do that to a guy. Plus, she looked so lost and out of place. Maybe she genuinely needed help. 
I hit the brakes, throwing the truck into park. My gut was screaming at me, but I ignored it. As I got closer, something seemed off. Even in the dim light, it looked like the back of her white dress was stained. And I realized she wasn't moving at all, just staring out towards the fields. That's when a shiver ran down my spine. Hey, lady, I called out, keeping a safe distance. Are you all right? She didn't respond. Not a twitch. Then, ever so slowly, her body turned. The sight hit me like a gut punch. Her face wasn't just pale. It was a sickly grayish color, and her eyes. Those eyes were completely black. No whites, no pupils, just two inky voids staring right at me. I froze. Adrenaline kicked in, my fight-or-flight instinct raging. Every rational thought screamed at me to get back in the truck and drive, but my limbs wouldn't respond. She started towards me, her movements jerky and uneven, like some broken doll. The stench hit me next, rot, decay, something worse. That was enough to snap me out of my trance. I scrambled back towards the truck, fumbled with the lock, and tumbled into the cab. My truck roared to life, tires spitting gravel. Glancing back, I saw her standing at the road's edge. Now she was running, her unnatural speed matching the truck in horrifying strides. I hammered the gas pedal to the floor. The engine whined in protest, but I didn't care. I pushed my rig as hard as I dared on those winding roads, my eyes glued to the rearview mirror. That chilling image of her, inky black eyes, putrid stench, and human speed chased me for miles. Finally, I reached a stretch of highway with a gas station. The harsh lights chased away some of the fear coiling in my gut. I didn't look back as I pulled in, just refueled in record time and got back on the interstate. The rest of the night was spent glancing over my shoulder every dark shape in the mirror setting off alarm bells in my head. By dawn, I'd put several states between me and that desolate stretch of road. I tried to convince myself it was just a nightmare, fatigue playing tricks on my eyes. But deep down, I knew that wasn't true. Something unnatural had been out there, something malevolent. When I got home, I told my wife about it. She looked at me like I was crazy. Tried suggesting too much coffee, lack of sleep, heat stroke. I let her think what she wanted. The truth was, I didn't want to think about it either, just forget the whole terrifying episode. But it's hard to sleep with the image of those obsidian eyes burned into your brain. For weeks, nightmares haunted me, the sickly sweet smell of decay that impossible sprint alongside my truck. One morning, I woke up and swore off those backroad routes. I'll stick to the well-lit interstates, even if it adds hours to my runs. I don't know what that thing was, if it was human or something older and darker that stalked those lonely roads. And I don't intend to ever find out. The police never found a body, no reports matching what I described. But sometimes, late at night, I still see movement in my mirror. And the thought lurks there, nestled in the darkest part of my mind. Maybe she's still out there, searching, waiting, her inky eyes fixed on the long, empty highways. My name is Curtis and this happened to me on October 12, 2003. I work as a truck driver, long-haul mostly, coast-to-coast -coast stuff. I enjoy being on the road, the freedom it gives. I don't have a wife or kids, never wanted any. This line of work wouldn't work out well with a family in tow anyways. I was on a run to deliver a load of industrial machinery down to Houston. Made good time 
passing through Oklahoma without much to report. That stretch of interstate can get a bit monotonous. But that boredom soon turned into something else entirely. It started with some flickering lights in the distance off the side of the road. Now, at first that ain't too unusual out there. Plenty of old farms or abandoned houses dotting the land. But as I got closer, something seemed off about those lights. There wasn't a structure in sight, just this erratic flashing coming from what looked like the middle of a field. Curiosity has never been my strong suit. Still, something about the whole situation felt wrong. I slowed the rig down, debating with myself about ignoring the whole thing. In the end, common sense lost out to that nagging little voice telling me to investigate. I pulled onto the shoulder, threw the flashers on, and grabbed a heavy flashlight from under the seat. Maybe it was some kids messing around, or a broken-down vehicle. Could even be one of those drone light shows, though that seemed unlikely out in the boonies. Each step closer to those lights, the worse that uneasy feeling in my gut grew. Something sharp smelled in the air, metallic almost. Whatever it was, it wasn't natural. The lights were coming from what looked like a shallow pit dug into the dirt. As I got to the edge, the flashlight beam cut through the darkness. I wish I hadn't looked. In that pit, the flickering light came from fires burning atop a heap of, I still struggled to call them bodies. Bone and flesh mixed in a way no living thing should be. They didn't look fully human, not entirely animal either. Some parts looked too big, others too small. Twisted all wrong. The smell hit me in a wave then, almost making me wretch. Bile and iron and something else I couldn't place. I stumbled back, tripping and falling on my backside. My heart hammered in my chest like it was trying to break free. That's when I saw him. He was standing a bit back from the pit, just inside the shadows. I couldn't make out his face, but his body, it looked too long the proportions all off. Stretched out in a way that reminded me of those old, warped funhouse mirrors. He wore a tattered brown suit, clothes that seemed too big for him, hanging loose in some places and straining in others. He didn't move, didn't even seem to be breathing, just stood there staring at me. I scrambled to my feet, blind panic the only thought in my head. Back to the truck seemed like a mile away, every footfall feeling like it took an hour. The flashlight slipped from my fingers, the beam useless now. I couldn't take my eyes off that figure, that unnaturally still thing in the darkness. The truck door felt heavier than usual as I yanked it open. Fumbling for the keys, my fingers were shaking so badly I couldn't even get them into the ignition. One glance in the rearview mirror sent me lunging into the driver's seat. That thing was closer, standing maybe twenty feet back, its head tilted to the side as if in question. Finally, the engine roared to life. I slammed the gear into drive and peeled out, tires spitting gravel. Glancing back, I could see him standing there, watching me disappear down the road. I didn't stop driving until I was a state away. Called the cops, of course, gave them the location. They found nothing, not even a trace of a fire or any disturbed earth. Figured they thought I was a crank, or some trucker hopped up on pills. Let them think that. I know what I saw. Since then, I've had trouble sleeping. I catch glimpses sometimes just at the edge of my sight. That lanky figure with his two long limbs. He's always at a distance, just observing. My roots changed, now sticking mainly to busy highways and well-lit truck stops. Nights alone in that cab are the worst. It feels like those shadows hold something just out of view, something waiting for the moment I drop my guard. I haven't told anyone else about this, not really. They'd laugh, call me crazy, 
maybe even report me and risk me losing my license. There are days I wonder if I did go crazy, if that stress and exhaustion finally caught up to me and made me see things that weren't there. But I can still smell that burning, metallic tang in my nightmares. I can still feel his eyes on me from the darkness. Whatever that thing was, I don't think it's done with me. Sometimes, late at night, I get the urge to pull over, step out of the truck, and face him. Part of me wants to know what he is, what he wants. The larger part of me, the part that wants to keep living, locks my foot down on the accelerator and forces me to keep driving. My name is Rowan, and this happened to me on July 4, 2011. I drive a truck, cross-country routes usually. Being on the road agrees with me, that sense of wide open space and possibility. My wife, bless her heart, worries some, but she knows it's in my blood. Can't chain a man to a desk, now can you? This trip in particular was a bit out of the ordinary. I usually haul manufactured goods, appliances, that sort of thing. This job, though, called for livestock transport. Cattle down to a ranch in West Texas. Never done that before, and it had me a bit edgy. Animals ain't the same as crates, and that added responsibility kept me on my toes. Made it through Oklahoma with no trouble. Those plains can be endless. But the cows napped, I listened to old bluegrass, and the miles went by smooth. Trouble started up as I passed the state line and got onto some narrower back roads down Texas Way. Place was called Sweetwater County, which was ironic on account of the stink of the air. Oil wells dotted the landscape, pump jacks bobbing like big metal birds. It all gave the land a sickly, yellowish tinge under that relentless sun. It was then I noticed that old pickup truck tailing me. Rattly thing, looked half rusted out and sporting a cracked windshield. It kept its distance, but never disappeared entirely from my rearview mirror. Figured it was some local, maybe a ranch hand curious about the trailer. Nightfall brought the real trouble. The headlights on my rig cut a bright swath down those empty roads, but I kept catching glimpses of other lights behind me, that pickup again. At first, it seemed like I was outpacing it. But then those lights started getting closer, flashing on and off like it was signaling me. That got under my skin. I pulled over to the side, hoping the idiot would just drive on by. No such luck. He slowed down, his headlights turning off completely, and rolled to a stop about fifty yards back. Seemed like there was just a lone figure in the driver's seat, hard to make out for certain in the dark. The rational part of my mind told me I was just being paranoid. Maybe the fella had engine trouble, needed some help. Still, a deep unease settled over me. I reached for the CB radio thinking about calling for a roadside assist or maybe the state troopers. I hesitated, my hand feeling like a lead weight on the microphone. Something about the stillness of that truck back there. It wasn't right. Then, the guy got out of his truck. He walked forward, a slow, lurching gait. Even with the distance, something looked off about his figure. He was tall, but lanky, his arms hanging way down past his waist, swinging out like with each step. In that weak moonlight, his face was mostly shadow, just a suggestion of a long, sharp jawline. My heart was jackhammering now. Panic surged through me, a primal thing telling me to get the hell out of there. I hit the gas, the truck lurching forward. My headlights caught him full on for just a second, gaunt face, thin to the point of looking skull-like, eyes sunk deep and glowing like hot coals in the shadows. 
the image seared itself into my brain. Behind me, that truck roared to life, headlights blazing. He was chasing me. Panic fueled me, kept me pushing down on that gas pedal. The old truck gained ground, its engine whining in a desperate, hungry way. He'd ram the back of the trailer, then swerve alongside, trying to force me off the road. Each bump, each swerve sent tremors through the cattle, their bellows growing louder, adding to the chaos. My mind raced, searching for a way out. My gun was locked in a box under the seat, and in those frantic moments, my shaking hands fumbled uselessly with the latch. The road stretched out, nothing but desolate desert scrub on either side. Nowhere to run, no one to call for help. I spotted a turnoff up ahead, a narrow dirt track leading off towards the oil fields. Reckless, probably, but I figured it was my best shot. I swerved hard, tires kicking up choking clouds of dust. The back wheels of the trailer fishtailed, and for a heart-stopping moment, I thought we'd roll. But the rig held, and I tore down that track, the headlights barely illuminating the rutted, uneven ground. Behind me, he followed. The track wound through the pump jacks, their metal limbs creaking like skeletons in the wind. I dodged and swerved, the man in the old truck a relentless pursuer. That's when I saw it up ahead, a chain-link fence surrounding one of the pump sites, a glimmer of razor wire cutting across the top. Desperate gamble time. I slammed the brakes, spun the wheel hard. Tires screeched, the trailer whipped around, and I aimed the truck straight at that fence. The collision was jarring, metal screeching and twisting. The fence tore loose with a terrible groan, coils of razor wire slashing against the rig's side. But I was through. Stunned and bleeding from shallow cuts, I ignored the pain. I slammed the gear into reverse, backed away, and hit the gas once more. In the rearview mirror, I caught a glimpse of the pickup truck entangled in the down fence, its front wheels spinning uselessly in the dirt. The adrenaline propelled me back out onto the road, my hands a vice grip on the wheel. Headlights blinked out in the distance as that pickup untangled itself, but I had a head start. The terror, though, refused to fade. He was out there, still hunting. The next few hours were a blur. I drove aimlessly, avoiding highways and towns, just trying to find a place where I could lose myself, catch my breath, and decide what the hell to do next. When dawn finally crept over the horizon, I was miles from where the chase had ended. My body trembled with exhaustion, my mind a mess of jumbled images and a terror that clung to my bones. I pulled the truck over, finally found the strength to climb out and inspect the damage. The side of the rig was scratched, dented, and splattered with blood, but nothing too serious. The trailer, that was where I saw the full impact of my escape. Deep gouges scarred the metal sides, and one rear tire was shredded, the rubber hanging in strips. Several of the cattle had been injured as well. A wave of guilt washed over me. I'd gotten out, but those poor animals had suffered because of my reckless actions. Gritting my teeth, I did what I could. With a trembling hand, I pulled my phone from the glove compartment and called the ranch, explaining what had happened. They sent a crew out right away, along with a vet to tend to the injured livestock. As I waited, that sense of dread settled back in. I hadn't escaped him, not really. He knew roughly where I was, and who knew how long that madman would keep up the hunt. Police hadn't been much help. My story sounded unhinged, and they'd found no sign of that pickup or anyone matching my description. Seemed they thought I'd cracked under the stress. Couldn't exactly blame them. The ranch crew arrived and we spent hours unloading the cattle and patching up the trailer as best we could. 
They offered me a ride back to the interstate, said I looked like I could use a hot meal and a proper bed. But I refused. Wasn't safe, not for them and not for me. Figured my best bet was to keep moving, make myself a hard target. They left me there beside the road with my battered rig, the sun dipping low in the sky. Climbing back into the driver's seat felt heavy, like stepping into a coffin. But what other choice did I have? I started the engine, the familiar rumble a small comfort against the overwhelming fear. Each shadow flickering past on that lonely road made me flinch, expecting to see that old pickup. I didn't sleep that night, just drove, fueled by a mix of truck stop coffee and that constant, gnawing terror. Days blurred into weeks. I avoided major roads, sticking to the backcountry two lanes and smaller towns where I could blend in a little easier. Showered in gas stations, slept in my seat under a blanket, a growing paranoia making a real bed seem like a luxury I could no longer afford. Some nights the exhaustion would win, and I'd doze off in some hidden turnout. Those nightmares were the worst. I'd see his gaunt face, his burning eyes, feel the relentless pursuit of that rusted-out pickup. I'd wake bathed in sweat, my heart pounding a desperate rhythm against my ribs. My work suffered. I lost loads, couldn't focus on deliveries. Dispatch started wondering if I had a drinking problem, and it wasn't far from the truth. Bottle of whiskey stashed under the seat became my closest companion— and always, always, I was looking over my shoulder. Every car on the road could be him. Every stranger in a diner could be those dark eyes studying me. I grew gaunt, unkempt, a shadow of the man I used to be. My wife, God bless her, begged me to come home, to see a doctor. But I couldn't go back, not while he was out there. Couldn't put her at risk. It's been... A while now, years maybe. Hard to keep track when time is measured in miles and cheap hotel rooms. I'm further south these days. Figure the heat and the border towns might offer some anonymity, a chance to disappear. But I know that's a fool's hope. The other night, I caught sight of an old pickup in a bar parking lot. Rusted, battered, that same damn cracked windshield. I don't know if it was really him or just my broken mind playing tricks. Dove back into that bottle, tried to drown out the memory. Some mornings, I think about pulling over, stepping out, and letting him finish what he started back on that Texas road. The idea has a twisted sort of relief to it, an end to this constant running. But then I remember those eyes. I remember my cattle— bellowing in fear and pain. And some stubborn, damn fool part of me won't give him that victory. So, I climb back into the rig, start the engine, and keep on driving, waiting for the day our paths cross again. And when they do, well, I reckon we'll see who runs out of road first. My name is Elias, and this happened to me on February 25, 1996. Funny how something like that sticks with you. I'm a long-haul trucker, been driving rigs since way back when I was just a greenhorn with more ambition than sense. I enjoy the solitude, though, those wide-open stretches of highway where it's just a man, his truck, and the endless roll of the road. Back then... I did mostly overnight runs through the Midwest and down south. Paid well, but the loneliness could start to gnaw at you during those long, quiet hours. I'd put on old AM radio shows to keep myself company, imagining them broadcasts were live instead of recordings from a time gone by. This particular run had me hauling a load of industrial machinery, boring as all hell, but it put food on the table. 
Everything went smooth until I hit the back roads cutting through a corner of rural Missouri. The sky was an inky black, the headlights of my rig slicing through the darkness like a hot knife. It was one of those stretches where civilization felt a million miles away, just me and the hum of the engine. That was when the coughing started. Soft at first, like it was coming from deep within my chest. I slapped my hand across the steering wheel and glanced in the rearview mirror, but nobody was there. That unease started to creep up on me, the kind you get when you feel eyes watching, even if you can't see them. The coughing grew louder, ragged and wet-sounding. I pulled the rig over to the shoulder of the road, cut the engine. The silence that washed over the cab was more unnerving than any noise, the stillness broken only by those rasping coughs. It wasn't coming from inside the truck, I realized. It was coming from the trailer. My heart started a jackhammer rhythm in my chest, and sweat broke out on the back of my neck. See, trailers shouldn't make noises that sound like dying. Common sense told me there must be a busted seal or a loose tarp flapping in the wind, some normal, perfectly reasonable explanation. Of course, common sense wasn't doing much for those goosebumps running down my arms or the tremor in my hands as I reached for the flashlight. I stepped down on the gravel, legs feeling weak as a newborn calf. The flashlight beam trembled as I walked toward the back of the trailer. The coughs were stronger, more like choked gasps by now. Each step felt more hesitant than the last, the irrational fear that I was walking into some kind of horror movie growing stronger. My light swept across the back of the rig, landed on the metal doors. They were clean, no dents, no blood, nothing out of place. But the sounds, if anything, were louder now. They came from below the doors, like something was pushing and straining to escape. I froze. My whole body clenched up so tight I thought my bones might snap. And that was when it hit me, the stench. Not gas, not rot, but something far older, musty like a crypt left unopened for centuries. It took every ounce of strength I had not to turn tail and run. Curiosity, or maybe sheer stupidity, got the better of me. I moved closer, the flashlight beam shaking like a leaf in a hurricane. I reached out, fingers brushing against the door handle. Cold. Cold like ice, even through my work gloves. The coughing stopped abruptly. I heard a shuffle, a scrape, like something shifting inside. And then silence. I stumbled back, tripped over my own damn feet, landing hard on the gravel. I didn't look away from those doors, from the darkness that seemed to seep through the cracks. My instincts were screaming at me to hit the gas, leave this cursed place in the dust. But some morbid fascination held me rooted to the spot. Minutes ticked by, and still nothing. The only sound was the drumming of my own heart against my ribs. With a trembling hand, I reached over and pressed the button on the trailer's hydraulic door. It lowered with a slow groan, revealing the darkness within. Inside was nothing. Empty. Just metal walls and floor, a few loose straps dangling like cobwebs. The smell had faded too, leaving only the clean, metallic scent of the machinery I'd hauled half the night. I stood staring my mind racing to make sense of it. Had I imagined the whole thing? The stress, the loneliness. Any driver on the road long enough had experienced those moments where your mind plays tricks on you. But what about the cold I felt on my fingers? The smell? I'd been doing this job too long to mistake it for anything but what it was, the stink of death. I slammed the trailer doors shut, scrambled back into the driver's seat, and tore out of that place like the hounds of hell were on my tail. Never looked back, not once. I finished the job, delivered the machinery on time, 
but something in me had changed after that night. I couldn't shake the memory, the sound of those coughs, that musty, chilling stink. Some folks thought I was losing it, seeing things after too many sleepless miles. Maybe they were right. But every now and then, out on the road late at night, I get that prickly feeling at the back of my neck. I catch a whiff of something foul, a scent of ancient decay. And I wonder if, somewhere out there, under the shroud of darkness, a trailer sits waiting, holding secrets better left undisturbed. My name is Harlan, and this happened to me on October 6, 2008. Back then I drove a truck, mostly regional halls through the Midwest so I could still spend evenings at home. Wife didn't love that I was gone at all, but those bills don't pay themselves. Besides, I liked the quiet of the road. This particular haul had me taking a load of car parts down to a factory in southern Illinois. Nothing out of the ordinary, just one of those runs that pay the mortgage and try not to let your brain turn to mush on the highway. Weather was clear, traffic was light, and I was making good time. That all changed as I turned off the interstate, heading down a two-lane county road. The area got pretty rural quick. Cornfields stretched out to both sides, the stalks rustled in the wind like a sea of whispers. Old farmhouses stood in various states of disrepair, some with weathered barns slumped behind them like tired old dogs. The late afternoon sun cast long shadows, turning any patch of woods into a place of creeping darkness. Something flickered at the edge of my vision. I jerked my head towards the woods, and caught a glimpse of movement a flash of pale skin slipping between the trees. Figured it was my eyes playing tricks on me, or maybe a deer spooked by the truck. Shaking it off, I turned my attention back to the road. Half a mile later, that same pale shape moved across an open stretch between the fields. I slammed on the brakes, the rig lurching to a stop. Nobody there. Whatever it was, it had moved fast, faster than anything human. A chill ran down my spine, and I did something I usually don't let myself do. I started imagining things. Common sense told me to forget it, keep driving, but there was a nagging feeling in my gut saying otherwise. I glanced at the gas gauge, still had over half a tank. Decision made, I pulled over to the side of the road, cut the engine, and grabbed my flashlight. Now I'm not a small guy, and I've held my own in a trucker bar brawl or two. But walking into those woods alone felt like the dumbest thing I'd ever done. Still, I pushed through the brittle cornstalks at the edge of the field, the flashlight beam cutting a weak swath into the dimness. No footprints, no broken branches, nothing to indicate what, or who, had been moving back there. It was starting to look like I was chasing my own damn shadow. I was about to head back to the truck when I saw something in the dirt. It was a piece of cloth, torn and faded, a baby blue color. Looked old, like part of a child's dress. Something about it made my stomach sink. I reached down to pick it up, and that's when I heard the laugh. It was high-pitched and raspy, echoing through the trees, bouncing off the cornstalks in a way that made it impossible to tell where it was coming from. Fear hit me like a cold wave. I didn't hesitate anymore, dropped the piece of cloth and sprinted back towards the truck. As I fumbled with the door handle, I heard it again, that eerie giggle, closer this time. My heart was hammering as I threw myself into the rig and slammed the door. I started the engine, hands shaking on the steering wheel. The headlights cut into the field as I turned and peeled out, leaving the woods and whatever was in them far behind. I didn't slow down until the cornfields were just a speck in my rearview mirror. 
pulled over at a truck stop a few towns down to grab a bite and try to steady my nerves. A waitress saw me come in, eyes wide and breathing rough, and brought me a coffee without even asking. Guess I looked that rattled. While I sipped the bitter brew, I tried to rationalize what had happened. Stress, lack of sleep, my damn imagination, anything to explain away the ghostly figure and the child's laughter. It didn't work. I couldn't shake the image of that torn piece of cloth or the feeling of being watched from the shadowy woods. There was something out there, something not right. Finished the delivery a few hours later. Drove straight home and didn't pick up another haul for a while after that. To this day, I avoid that stretch of road out in Illinois. Some places, they just carry a bad feeling with them. Best to steer clear. Years later, I saw a news report about a missing girl in that county. Disappeared off her family's farm, never found. They showed a picture of her, a smiling little thing in a faded blue dress. I didn't need to see any more. Sometimes I wonder if whatever I saw out there that day was connected to her. No way to know for sure. But on the long nights, out on the road, when the shadows stretch across the asphalt, I sometimes hear a faint echo of that chilling laughter in the back of my mind. I always turn the radio up a bit louder. My name is Beckett, and this happened to me on July 22, 1993. I drove a truck up and down the East Coast, everything from furniture to fresh produce to factory machinery. Keeps life interesting, as my old man used to say. I never thought much about the cargo itself, just focused on the road and getting the job done. That all changed on a sweltering summer run down to Savannah, Georgia. I was driving a refrigerated rig that day, keeping the temp dialed down for whatever was supposed to be inside. The pickup location was in Jersey, a warehouse off a back road with faded signs and broken windows. Didn't even have a real loading dock, just a pair of rough-looking guys with forklifts who grunted more than they talked. They loaded me up with a bunch of sealed crates, plain wood, nothing fancy. Seemed strange that they needed those refrigerated, but I wasn't about to ask questions. Sometimes it's best not to know what you're hauling. Set off with the sun just beginning to dip below the horizon, hoping to make good time and avoid the worst of the summer heat. The first few hours went smooth, just me and the hum of the engine on the interstate. But as night fell and I cut through Virginia, the temperature in the trailer started to fluctuate. I pulled over at a rest stop and checked the readings. It was going up by a degree every few minutes, nothing drastic, but definitely wrong. Figured it must be a malfunction in the refrigeration unit. By now, I was starting to get uneasy. There was no smell, nothing leaking or rattling in the trailer, just that slow, steady climb in temperature. I called dispatch and they said the load was high priority, had to be delivered on time no matter what. Frustrated, but with those bills to pay, I got back on the road. That's when I heard the thump. Soft at first, like a fist against wood from the back of the trailer. I ignored it, told myself it was probably just the cargo shifting with the road. But the thumping kept growing louder, more rhythmic. Along with it, the temperature continued to rise. The panic started to set in as the thumping evolved into a hard pounding. I pulled over and threw open the trailer doors. Bathed in the red glow of the taillights, the crates were stacked as I left them. But something beneath the wood seemed to be twitching, straining against the sides. That was when I really lost it. Slammed the doors shut, leaped back into the driver's seat and floored the gas pedal. Sped down the highway, 
the pounding now a relentless drumming against my sanity, the trailer swaying dangerously from the erratic driving. I saw a sign for a stateway station, a last flicker of hope in that desperate moment. Swerved in and barreled towards the brightly lit inspection building. The guards stared in shock as I plowed past the scale and screeched to a halt. I flung myself out of the truck yelling about the cargo, but they just looked at me like I was some kind of escaped lunatic. Before things could escalate, one of the guards tilted his head. He must have been listening intently because he swore, then shouted at his buddies to open the trailer. They came at it with crowbars and bolt cutters, their faces grim. I still struggled to describe what I saw in those crates. Forms, human forms, or what used to be. Each crate held several people, maybe a dozen total. They were naked, hairless, emaciated to the point their skin sagged against jutting bones. But they were alive, their sunken eyes opening, their hands feebly reaching out towards the light. Chaos erupted. Emergency vehicles swarmed in, men in biohazard suits moved among the crates. They swarmed over my truck, questioning me, taking swabs, and confiscating my driving logs. Someone shoved a blanket around my shoulders, which probably should have been comforting, but only felt cold and alien against my shaking body. I never learned what those creatures in the back of my rig were. Some kind of government experiment gone wrong, a sicko's twisted collection. I tried not to dwell on the possibilities. It didn't matter. Because after that night, I quit my job, sold my truck, and moved as far away from any interstate as I could get. Now I live in a cabin on the edge of a national forest in Montana. The quiet suits me, most days. But some nights, when the wind whistles through the trees in just the right way, I close my eyes and hear that pounding again. Each thud carries the weight of unseen horrors. It's a soundtrack that'll haunt me to my grave, I suspect. Sometimes, in those restless hours, I wonder if I did the right thing running, or if facing whatever was in those crates might have been better than carrying the guilt. I'll never know for sure. But one thing is certain, there are stretches of highway I'll never drive again. That steady rise in temperature I'd always taken for granted now fills me with a bone-deep terror, a coldness in my soul that no amount of sunlight can ever thaw. My name is Colton, and this happened to me on October 23, 2009. Been a driver for going on 15 years, local routes mostly. That predictability is what I like home for my wife and kids every night, a paycheck you can count on. Life ain't glamorous, but it's steady, and that counts for a lot. This particular night... I was finishing up a delivery run down to an old warehouse district on the edge of New Orleans. City planners talk about revitalizing the area, but that's mostly pie-in-the-sky dreams. Buildings are crumbling, streets are cracked and potholed, and you get the sense that if the shadows could talk, they'd have some real ugly stories to tell. Finished unloading my rig around midnight, got the paperwork signed, and headed back to the lot. Now, I'm not the jumpy type, but being alone in a place like that sets your teeth on edge. I picked up my pace, casting glances into the dim pools of light cast by the broken street lamps. That's when I heard the rustling sound. It was coming from the fenced in lot next to one of the warehouse's chain link rattling, and something heavy moving against the dirt. Figured it was a stray dog or maybe a raccoon. But something primal in my gut kept me from just ignoring it. Against my better judgment, I went closer. Peered through the fence into the darkness and could just make out a shape, large and bulky, hunched over near the far wall. Hello? I called out. Stupid, I know, 
but I couldn't just walk away. The shape jerked upright, and that's when I saw it wasn't an animal. It was a man, tall, freakishly tall, with limbs that looked too long, the way they moved all jerky and unnatural. He stood motionless for a moment, just a silhouette against the grimy warehouse wall. Then, he slowly turned his head towards me. In the dimness, I couldn't make out his features, but there was a wrongness to the way he moved, like his joints were bending in ways they shouldn't. My heart was pounding so hard I thought it would burst right through my ribs. Just then, he hissed, a long, chilling sound that sliced through the quiet night. I didn't wait for more. Turned and ran, tearing down the street back towards my truck. Behind me, I heard the rattling of the fence, like he was climbing it. I fumbled with my keys, hands slick with sweat as I shoved them into the truck's ignition. The engine roared to life, and I shifted into gear, tires squealing as I peeled away from the curb. In my rearview mirror, I saw a dark, shambling figure emerge from the lot. It moved with eerie speed, long strides quickly eating up the distance between us. My mind raced to make sense of it. That shape, those impossible movements, the hissing, nothing about it felt human. The street curved sharply ahead, and for a heart-stopping moment, it looked as if he'd cut me off, that lanky form materializing from the darkness. I slammed the brakes, swerving hard to avoid a collision. The truck went into a skid, and I wrestled for control, finally managing to bring it to a lurching stop. I looked around frantically, but the figure was gone, vanished into the shadows as suddenly as he'd appeared. I waited, barely breathing, listening for any sound. Nothing but the pounding of my own terrified pulse and the soft whir of the truck engine idling. Finally, dare to look back down the empty street. There was no one there. I shifted back into drive and kept going, not stopping until I was miles away and safely on the interstate. Called my wife once I got the truck parked back at the lot, told her something had come up, that I wouldn't be home that night. Her voice was worried, but I brushed her off, mumbling something about finding a diner and a motel. I didn't want to explain what had happened, not because I doubted she believed me, but because I barely believed it myself. Spent that night staring at a chip motel ceiling, trying to convince myself it was just fatigue and a bit of late-night spookiness. But deep down, I know that's not true. Sometimes, when I'm on those empty roads at night, and the shadows stretch long across the asphalt, a prickle of fear runs down my spine. I tell myself it's just my imagination playing tricks. But that night in New Orleans I saw something that lurks on the fringe of reality, a creature of twisted limbs and inhuman hisses. And I know, without a shadow of a doubt, that it saw me too. My name's Frank, and this happened back in 2010. I've been driving rigs for over 25 years, so you'd think I saw it all. Nothing prepares you for some things, though. Home life wasn't great, the wife always nagging, kids wrapped up in their own worlds. Trucking gave me solitude, a little bit of my own kingdom on the road. That summer, I had a night run through the Mojave Desert. You know the stretch, miles of emptiness, just sand and scrub. My radio died a few hours in, only static. Sometimes, that silence works on you. I started seeing things in the headlights, movement, just off the highway. Probably my mind playing tricks after too much coffee. Needed a break, so I pulled off into a rest area. Just a gravel lot, a few grimy picnic tables, and an overflowing trash can. As I walked the dog behind the lot, something crunched under my boot. 
I looked down and froze. It was a bone. Human, I think. A piece of skull, maybe. That's when the smell hit me. Like roadkill multiplied a hundred times, rotting in the sun. I called the dog back, got out of there as fast as I could. Back on the interstate, my headlights caught something up ahead. A figure standing by the roadside. I slowed, curious and a little freaked out. As I got closer, the details made my blood run cold. This guy, he was emaciated, ribs poking out like a skeleton. Clothes hung off him, torn and filthy. His hair was matted, beard scraggly, and his eyes, they were just black holes in his skull. He stared at me as I passed, and a chill ran down my back. The next morning, I stopped at a diner, desperate for a shower and company. The waitress was glued to the news on the old TV behind the bar. Headline flashed missing hiker, Mojave region. They showed a picture of a young man smiling. Wasn't the guy I saw, but a wave of unease washed over me. Back on the road, I couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. Turns out, I wasn't wrong. A day or so later, I pulled into another rest stop to stretch my legs. There, behind a dumpster, was a crude shelter, rags and some broken pallets. And inside, bones. Piles of them, some cracked and not on. I snapped a photo on my phone and hightailed it out of there. Called the cops, but by the time they showed up, the shelter was empty. Over the next few weeks, I kept seeing him. Different places along my route, always watching from a distance. At first, I wondered if it was my imagination, the stress getting to me. Then, there was the incident with Charlie. Charlie was an old-timer, drove a similar route to mine. We always stopped for coffee at a place in southern Nevada. One morning, he wasn't there. Found out later his truck was abandoned off the highway, engines still idling, doors wide open. No sign of Charlie. The cops questioned me, of course. Showed them the picture I took. They got real quiet told me sometimes people disappear in the desert. Case closed. I wasn't satisfied. Started keeping a tally, noting places I saw that gaunt figure lurking. Turns out, there was a string of unsolved missing persons cases all along my route, stretching back years. Victims always vanished around isolated stretches of highway. One night... I decided to take a stand, bought myself a hunting rifle, loaded it up, parked my rig at one of his usual spots, waited inside with the windows cracked. Hours ticked by, and as dawn started to break, there he was, shambling out of the brush. I raised the rifle, finger on the trigger. His head snapped towards me, those hollow eyes locking on my hiding place. For a long moment, we stared at each other. Then he moved. Not a run, or a charge, but a slow, unnatural stalk, like a predator sizing up its prey. I squeezed the trigger, but my hands were shaking. The shot went wide, echoing off the rocks. He didn't flinch. Just kept coming, closing the distance between us. I fired again, and again the smell of gunpowder filling the cab. It was only when the gun clicked empty that panic truly kicked in. I fumbled with the lock, throwing the truck into gear and slamming my foot on the gas. The engine roared, and I peeled out of the rest area, tires kicking up gravel. I glanced in the rearview mirror, my heart pounding. He stood at the edge of the clearing, watching me go, a silhouette against the rising sun. I didn't stop driving for the next twenty-four hours. Tossed the rifle out the window somewhere in Utah, feeling more like a hunted animal myself with each passing mile. Finally, I collapsed into a cheap motel bed and slept like the dead. When I woke, 
It wasn't the nightmares that terrified me the most. It was the news report on the TV. A family of four, heading to the Grand Canyon, had vanished from their campsite. Their car was found parked on the shoulder of the interstate, a hastily packed picnic spread out beside it. No signs of struggle, no witnesses. Just gone. The guilt hit me like a ton of bricks. If I'd done something sooner, acted instead of running, maybe I could have stopped him. Maybe they'd still be alive. I made a decision right then. Turned in my resignation to the trucking company, sold most of my stuff, and moved north. Alaska, about as far as you can get from the desert within the continental U.S., took a job at a remote fishing lodge, surrounded by mountains and trees and blessedly empty roads. The solitude helped for a while. I got into a routine, kept my head down. Then one day, a newspaper article caught my eye at the general store. Hunter stumbles across grisly find in Wyoming wilderness. It described a half-devoured campsite, human remains scattered amongst the wreckage. The timeline fit. He'd followed my trail. The nights got worse after that. I'd wake up in a cold sweat, feeling those eyes on me again. Cabin started to feel like a prison. I couldn't stay. A few months later, I packed up my meager belongings and bought a one-way boat ticket as far north into the Arctic as I could afford. Small Inuit village, accessible only by sea during the warm season. The locals were wary of the outsider at first, but I earned my keep doing odd jobs, learning their ways. Winters are harsh up here. Bitter cold, the sun disappearing for months perfect place for someone like me to hide. Even out here, though, I never felt truly safe. Always kept a loaded shotgun near the bed, just in case. One blizzardy night, as the wind howled and the cabin creaked, I thought I heard something outside. A scratching at the window, maybe? I told myself it was just the storm, tried to ignore the dread creeping up my spine. The next morning, walking into the village for supplies, I noticed the tracks. They started at the edge of the ice and led right up to my cabin door before circling back, disappearing into the swirling snow. Footprints. Too big to be an animal. Too misshapen to belong to one of the villagers. My hand trembled as I reached for the shotgun slung across my back. It's been weeks since then. Snow hasn't stopped falling much. Radio says another blizzard's on the way. I'm running out of food and out of hope. He found me again, thousands of miles away. Doesn't matter where I go, it seems. Some nights, when the wind dies down, and the only sound is my own ragged breathing, I swear I hear him out there, whispering my name on the frozen air, waiting. My name's Jack, and this happened to me back in 1998. I drove long haul then, mostly cross-country routes. Wife griped, but the money was good, and I liked the open road. Not a lot to think about besides the miles stretching out ahead. That summer, they sent me on a run I'd never done before, Wyoming, up into Montana. Remote country. Barely another vehicle on the road for hours at a stretch. Cell reception was spotty, which bothered me at first. Then it turned into a kind of peace, like I was the only one left in the world. I stopped for the night in a nowhere town in southern Wyoming. Just a gas station, a diner run by a tired-looking waitress, and a dusty motel. Figured I'd grab a quick bite, try to get some sleep. As I walked the dog behind the motel, my boots scuffed against something hard. Glanced down and saw a piece of bone, bleached white. Now, bones don't freak me out, being from farm country. 
but this was different. Seemed too big for a deer or coyote, had a weird curve to it. I thought about taking it with me, maybe asking someone to identify it, but something gave me the creeps. Left it lying there. Back on the road the next morning, that bone kept nagging at me. Something about the shape, the place where I found it, it gnawed at the back of my mind. I started paying close attention to my surroundings, every flicker of movement in the scrubland. Stopped for gas at a lonely crossroads a few hours later. As I pumped fuel, an old sedan pulled up, paint peeling, duct tape holding a cracked window together. Two guys climbed out, rough-looking, kind of faces that made me reach for the door lock. They weren't paying me any mind, though. The one on the passenger side kept staring out towards the sagebrush, mumbling under his breath. I heard him say something like, Time to move on. He's close. The driver nudged him, and they both piled back into their piece of junk car, peeling off towards the mountains. I watched them go, unease prickling at my neck. Late that afternoon, I crossed into Montana. The landscape got wilder, deep ravines, jagged rock formations. Stopped for a pit break at a turnout, and that's when I saw him for the first time. Just a glimpse, a hunched figure hunkered down behind a boulder. I froze. He was far enough away that I couldn't make out details, but the way he moved, unnatural-like, sent shivers down my spine. When I dared to look again, he was gone. I spent the rest of the drive in a state of high alert. Every creak of the truck, every shadow that flickered across the highway had me jumping. Knew, with gut-level certainty, that I wasn't alone out there. When I finally got to the drop-off point, it was already dusk. Isolated warehouse at the edge of a sprawling ranch. Just me, the guy at the loading dock and miles of rolling grassland. Doc Wicker, an older fella named Pete, saw my face and must have sensed my nerves. He offered me coffee, tried to make conversation. It helped a little. Until he mentioned folks going missing up in those hills. Hikers, the odd rancher, sometimes their bodies found, sometimes not. Wild animals get some, sure. But there's others— well, let's just say the wilderness ain't the only thing to fear out here, he said. Gave me a long look. That night, I didn't sleep a wink. Parked my rig facing the open plains, and kept a shotgun propped beside me. Every rustle of the wind, every distant howl of a coyote made my skin crawl. Come morning, I loaded up and hightailed it out of there. Called the company. Told them I wouldn't run that route again. No way, no how. They didn't hassle me too bad, luckily. Words spread quick amongst the drivers about my refusal. Some laughed, called me a scaredy cat. Others, they got a look in their eyes, a kind of unspoken understanding. Then the story started trickling in. A driver who saw a figure bone thin, lurking near his truck at a rest stop. Another who found a campsite, torn and shredded, like a wild beast had been through it. One morning, over eggs at a truck stop, I met up with Charlie, seasoned old trucker with a reputation for never backing down. This time, Charlie was pale, hands shaking. He told me how his rig broke down in the middle of nowhere. Said he saw something out there, watching him from the ridge line and it wasn't an animal. Never saw Charlie again after that day. Some folks think there's a serial killer roaming those empty stretches of highway. Others whisper about something older, wilder, something that ain't human at all. Me, I don't rightly know what's out there. But I know this. Every time I'm on a lonely stretch of road, my eyes keep flickering to the rearview mirror half expecting to see a gaunt figure padding along behind me, getting closer with every mile.
My name is Frank, and this happened to me in the summer of 1994. I was 30 years old. Back then, I worked as a truck driver, long hauls up and down the East Coast. It was tiring work, but at least I was young enough to handle it. Most routes were routine, but this one stood out in my memory all these years later. I drew a load heading from Baltimore to Bangor, Maine. Not a bad drive, usually about 12 to 14 hours depending on traffic and if I hit any snags along the way. Weather looked good, so I felt decent about the trip. I fired up the truck and headed out, planning to take I-95 all the way up. The first few hours went smooth, and I made good time getting through New York. After that, traffic thinned out considerably. I cruised past rolling hills and fields dotted with cows. The summer sun beat down hard. That old truck didn't have the best air conditioning. Around late afternoon, I started seeing signs for Augusta, Maine. I thought about stopping to grab some dinner, but honestly, I wanted to get this route done with. My eyes were getting heavy, and I desperately needed to sleep in a real bed. I decided to push through. Night was falling fast when I reached the outskirts of Augusta. My stomach grumbled in protest at my decision to skip a proper meal. I started keeping an eye out for a rest stop or diner, anything to break up the monotony of the road. I even debated whether to take a detour into the town proper, find a hotel, and finish the run in the morning. That's when I saw it, a small, weathered sign half hidden by a cluster of trees. Jake's Diner Two Miles The promise of greasy food and strong coffee was too much to resist. I signaled and turned off the highway. The road wound through a dense stretch of woods, the trees forming a dark tunnel overhead. I flipped on my high beams. They cut through the gloom, revealing a narrow, gravel lane. I followed it for a good five minutes, wondering if I'd made a mistake. Shouldn't this place have been right off the main road? Suddenly, the trees cleared. I found myself in a small, dirt lot in front of a rundown building. A flickering neon sign hung askew above the door. It simply said, Eat. I parked the truck and hopped out. My legs were stiff, the cab cramped after the long journey. As I walked toward the diner, a sense of unease prickled the back of my neck. The place was dead silent. No birds chirping or crickets, just an unnatural stillness hanging in the air. All the windows were boarded up, except for one with a dim yellow light shining through. Well, I was already here. I pushed through the door and stepped inside. The inside of Jake's was as dreary as the outside. Cracked linoleum floors, a chip counter, and a row of empty vinyl booths. Every surface was coated in a thick layer of dust. Behind the counter, an ancient cash register sat with its drawer hanging open. I called out, Hello? Anyone here? No answer. The back of the diner led into a dark hallway. A single light flickered faintly from a half-open door at the end. I figured it must have been the kitchen— a rumbling from my empty stomach pushed me forward. Just when I was about to knock, the kitchen door swung wide. A hulking figure emerged. He was tall, at least six and a half feet, with wide shoulders and arms thick as tree trunks. His tangled, dark hair reached down to a bushy, untamed beard. A stained apron hung around his neck and his massive hands were covered in what looked like old, dried blood. My first thought was that he was the cook. But something was off, something I couldn't quite put my finger on. He didn't say a word, just stared at me with piercing eyes. They were a chilling shade of pale blue, almost inhuman. My unease morphed into outright fear. This guy was dangerous, I could sense it. Can I get a burger or something? 
I ventured, my voice strained. He still didn't speak. Instead, he slowly shook his head, his eyes locked with mine. His expression was blank, devoid of any emotion. That's when I noticed the smear of blood across the front of his apron, the way his fingers twitched ever so slightly. My breath caught in my throat. A primal instinct took over and I stumbled back. I needed to get out of there. I bolted back toward the front door, my heart pounding. As I fumbled with the handle, I heard a low growl from behind me. It wasn't quite human, not quite animal, but it sent a shiver down my spine. I threw the door open and scrambled out into the night, not daring to look back. The figure didn't follow me immediately, allowing me to stumble through the parking lot toward my truck. I nearly tripped twice on the uneven ground, my fear propelling me forward. Reaching my truck, I fumbled for the keys, my fingers shaking so badly I could barely slot them into the ignition. The engine roared to life. I floored the gas pedal, spraying gravel in my wake as I sped down the narrow road. In the rearview mirror, I caught a glimpse of the diner and the hulking figure now standing in the doorway, watching me with those chilling, empty eyes. My heart hammered in my chest as I hurtled back toward the highway. I didn't stop speeding until I saw the comforting glow of Augusta's streetlights. I found a motel on the edge of town and collapsed onto the lumpy bed. As much as I tried, sleep wouldn't come. The image of that man with his bloody apron and inhuman eyes haunted my dreams, replaying over and over. The next morning, I skipped breakfast, instead opting for a strong cup of black coffee at the gas station. I climbed back into the truck and pushed on to Bangor, the unease gnawing at me the whole way. I finished the route without any more incidents. Back in Baltimore, I immediately went to the nearest police station. I told the officer on duty everything that had happened at Jake's diner. To my surprise, he didn't laugh or dismiss my story. He listened intently then explained that they had been investigating several strange occurrences in that region of Maine, missing persons, reports of disturbing animal carcasses found in the woods. My description of the man I encountered seemed to fit a pattern they were seeing. We'll send someone up to the area to check it out, the officer promised. I left the station feeling a mix of relief and a lingering dread. What was going on in that stretch of woods? Who was that man, and what had he done? News of any break in the case never reached me, and Jake's diner vanished from my immediate thoughts over time. Yet, the memory of that night lingered like a scar in the back of my mind. I became more wary of isolated roads and strange diners popping up out of nowhere. I started taking shorter routes, sacrificing pay for the illusion of safety. My girlfriend at the time started complaining that I was always on edge, jumpy at any sudden noise. My sleep was plagued with fitful nightmares, often waking up in a cold sweat and unable to fall back asleep. This wasn't just a bad experience anymore. It had changed me. A few years later, my girlfriend had enough, and I didn't blame her. The long nights away from home and my constant paranoia took its toll on our relationship. She left, and I felt a mixture of heartbreak and relief. It was one less person I had to worry about protecting. One day, while filling up my truck, the gas station TV was on in the background and a local main news story caught my attention. My blood ran cold as I recognized the photo from the bulletin the hulking man with the vacant eyes and blood-stained apron. The report detailed a series of brutal murders and disappearances tied to an abandoned diner deep in the woods. The suspect remained at large, and a massive manhunt was underway. That was it for me. I sold my truck, found an office job, and moved to a city where I could blend into the crowd. It wasn't a flashy life 
but at least I slept better. I never drove that stretch of highway again. I avoided isolated places, and I never, ever stopped at a roadside diner that wasn't part of a well-known chain. Sometimes, I wonder about the other victims, those who might have crossed paths with the man from Jake's diner and paid a terrible price. There's a nagging guilt that eats away at me, the feeling that I could have prevented some of those tragedies if I had just pushed the police harder to act. Maybe if I had been braver, shouted a warning to the world. But mostly, I'm just grateful to have survived my encounter with him. Deep down, I know it could have been a lot worse. I could have ended up as just another face on a missing person's poster, my name lost in a string of unsolved crimes. Even after all these years, a chill runs down my spine when I see a secluded diner on a remote road. And even in the heart of a busy city, I still find myself looking over my shoulder, checking for that hulking figure with the cold, dead eyes. My name is Jack, and this happened to me in the fall of 2002. I was a truck driver, had been for nearly 20 years. Loved the open road and the sense of freedom. Wife didn't like it much, said those long hauls kept me away too often. Guess she was right about that. This particular run had me taking fresh produce from California all the way to Portland, Maine. Long way to go for some carrots and lettuce, but it paid the bills. The first leg of the trip was easy enough, crossing the wide open spaces of the Midwest. That vastness always put things in perspective, made my troubles seem small compared to the endless stretch of sky. Then I hit the Appalachians. That's where things got tricky. The roads wound and twisted through the mountains, steep climbs followed by sharp, blind curves. To make matters worse, a nasty drizzle had settled in, turning the pavement slick. I had to slow down considerably, adding hours to my drive. The sun was long gone by the time I reached West Virginia, the forest crowding in on both sides of the narrow highway. My tired eyes kept playing tricks on me. Every shadow looked like a deer ready to bolt. Every flicker of light resembled the eyes of an animal lurking in the woods. I rolled down my window, the crisp night air helping to keep me alert. Just when I was ready to call it quits for the night, I saw a sign peeking through the trees. Ethel's home cook in five miles. That sounded better than another night of gas station sandwiches. I flipped my blinker and took the exit. The road wound deeper into the forest. Five miles turned into ten, then fifteen. I started to question my decision. Finally, a dim light blinked through the dense foliage. Relief washed over me. I pulled into a gravel lot in front of a beat-up, wooden building with peeling paint. A hand-painted sign hung above the door the faded lettering barely visible. Ethel's, it read. My stomach rumbled in protest, but unease settled in as I walked across the lot. The windows were dark, and an unnatural silence hung in the air. A busted neon sign flickered above the door, buzzing faintly. I reached for the handle and hesitated. Maybe it was the lateness of the hour, or the sense of isolation— but my instincts screamed at me to turn back. Hunger won out. I pushed open the door and was greeted by an oppressive blast of stale air. The interior was even worse than the outside. Dust motes hung in the shaft of light from a single naked bulb. Mismatched tables and chairs were scattered haphazardly. Dried ketchup stains marred the tablecloths. A cracked mirror behind the counter reflected nothing but the desolate scene. Hello? My voice echoed in the empty space. After a few moments, a curtain at the back of the diner twitched slightly. 
a woman emerged, her once bright apron smudged with grease and something darker. Her dark hair was scraped back in a haphazard bun, and her eyes were narrowed with suspicion. Close, she said flatly, her voice rough and unfriendly. I saw your sign out on the main road. I protested. I'm real hungry. Anything you could rustle up would be appreciated. Her eyes flicked over me, lingering on my company logo emblazoned across my jacket. The suspicion faded, replaced by something I couldn't quite name. Finally, she grunted and gestured towards a table half-hidden in the shadows. Sit. I'll fix you something, Dot. The chair creaked ominously beneath my weight as I waited, the silence pressing in upon me. From the back, I heard the clank of pans and the sizzle of oil. After an eternity, the woman reemerged and slammed a plate down in front of me. I peered at it, a burger, so overcooked it resembled a hockey puck, and a pile of fries that looked suspiciously like they might have been salvaged from the trash. My stomach turned, but I forced a smile. Thanks, this looks great. She grunted again and stalked away. I poked at the burger with a plastic fork, wincing as it snapped in half. My eyes scanned the diner, searching for any sign of another living soul, but there was none. Feeling increasingly uncomfortable, I decided to eat fast and get back on the road. As I picked begrudgingly at my food, I noticed a flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye. My head snapped up, and I stared in horror at a side window. Pressed against the glass was a face, or something like it. The skin was stretched taut against bone, the eyes sunken and glowing with an inhuman yellow light. A guttural snarl twisted its lips, revealing rows of jagged teeth. I dropped my fork with a clatter, my entire body rigid with terror. Instinct took over, a surge of adrenaline pushing me back from the table. The creature at the window hissed. It slammed a massive, clawed hand against the glass, which shook but held. I lunged towards the exit, every muscle screaming in protest. I fumbled with the door handle, panic clouding my vision. The thing crashed against the window repeatedly. Shards of glass exploded inward as it tried to force its way through. My fingers finally found the latch. I threw the door open and scrambled outside. I didn't look back but raced through the dark lot, the sound of snarling and breaking glass propelling me towards my rig. I reached the cab, tore the door open, and hauled myself inside. My hands shook violently as I searched for the keys, finally dropping them twice before managing to jam them in the ignition. The engine roared to life. I slammed the gear shift into reverse, never once taking my eyes off the diner. The creature lurched out, its grotesque body outlined against the light spilling from the doorway. I threw the truck into drive and floored the accelerator gravel flying out from under the tires. In the rearview mirror, I watched as the diner shrank, disappearing into the gloom of the forest. But even the rumble of the diesel engine couldn't drown out the image of the monstrous face burned into my mind. I drove through the night, never stopping, never looking in the mirrors. The first fingers of dawn reached across the horizon when I finally stumbled into a rest stop. Slumping against the steering wheel, I let out a shuddering breath, exhaustion and terror finally crashing over me. I sat there for hours, the morning sun baking the interior of the truck, but I couldn't bring myself to move. I was afraid of what I'd see over my shoulder, what might emerge from the shadows. Eventually, the fear of being caught dozing at the wheel by some patrolling cop outweighed the fear of the forest. Stiffly, I climbed out and checked around the truck, finding nothing but the litter of fast food wrappers and crushed soda cans. It took me another week to complete my delivery and return home.
The image of the creature haunted my every waking moment, and sleep, when it came, was filled with nightmares. I jump at every sudden sound, every strange shadow. My wife tried to convince me it was stress, a bad dream brought on by too many nights on the road. Maybe she was right. But I kept my eyes on the rearview mirror, constantly scanning the passing cars, the trees at the edge of the highway. It never reappeared, the creature from Ethel's. Yet, the memory of its inhuman hunger was enough to change me forever. My days of long hauls ended right then and there. I found a local driving job that let me sleep in my own bed each night. A few months after my terrifying experience, I was cleaning out my rig, preparing to turn it in. Something glinted under the driver's seat. Curiosity peaked. I retrieved the object. It was a locket, a cheap, tarnished piece of costume jewelry. But as I pried the locket open, my stomach churned. Inside was a photo. It was a younger, vibrant version of the woman from the diner. Her eyes, filled with warmth and life, stared back at me. The locket slipped from my trembling fingers. There was only one explanation, horrific as it was. Somewhere out there, in the vast network of highways and hidden roads, the creature waited. It had worn the locket, a perverse connection to the person it used to be, a chilling reminder of the monstrous acts it now committed. The woman from Ethel's may be gone, replaced by a ravenous shell. The terror, for victims like me, remained. I knew, with sickening certainty, that there were others out there like Ethel. Others who used the isolation, the allure of a hot meal, to trap unsuspecting travelers. The locket was my grim trophy, a stark reminder that some roads are best left untraveled, some curiosities never satisfied. And when hunger strikes at the side of a lonely highway diner, it's sometimes wiser to trust your gut and just keep on driving. My name is Marcus, and this happened to me in the spring of 1998. I'd been driving trucks for about seven years, and I prided myself on my safe record. Never had an accident, never been late on a delivery. Heck, I even won. Driver of the month. A few times back at the company depot. That streak almost came to an abrupt and bloody end on a remote stretch of highway in the Wyoming wilderness. I was nearing the end of a long haul from Seattle to Denver. The route took me through some beautiful but lonely country, especially as I crossed the Bighorn Mountain Range. Up there, it was just me, the road, and the endless sky. Should have enjoyed the peace and quiet, but the isolation always made me a bit uneasy. Never knew what you might find broken down on the side of the road that far from civilization. The sun was beginning to dip below the mountain peaks when I saw the flickering lights of a car up ahead. It was pulled over on the shoulder with its hazards blinking. I slowed, debating whether to stop. Part of me wanted to see if I could help whoever it was. Another part of me... A stronger part urged me to keep on driving. I glanced at the fuel gauge, still about half a tank, enough to get me to the next town, where I could call for a tow truck. Feeling a pang of guilt, I tapped the accelerator and started to pass. But just then, a figure emerged from the darkness beside the car woman, waving frantically. I slammed on the brakes. The truck swerved slightly my heartbeat pounding in my throat. Against my better judgment, I put it in park and climbed out. The cold mountain air cut right through me. It smelled like pine and something else, something musky that I couldn't place. The woman rushed towards me, her face a mask of desperation. She must have been in her late twenties, her dark hair tangled, 
her jeans and flannel shirt stained with dirt. Please, oh please, she cried. My cell phone is dead, and I don't get any signal out here. Can I use your phone, or maybe you could give me a ride to the next town? I swear I'm not gonna hurt you. Up close, something about her seemed off. Her eyes held a wildness, a flicker of something that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Yet, there was a genuine plea in her voice. All right, I sighed, reaching for my phone in my pocket. Let me just call a tow truck. They can figure out your car. When I glanced back up, her expression had changed. Her eyes narrowed, and a predatory grin spread across her face. Actually, she hissed, I think I've changed my mind. A surge of adrenaline shot through me. I took a step back, my hand going to the pocket where I kept my pocket knife. Too late. She lunged, moving with shocking speed. Rough, calloused hands grabbed my shoulders, throwing me to the ground. The knife went flying, skittering out of reach on the pavement. The woman was straddling me, her weight pinning me down her breath hot and foul on my face. I thrashed, trying to kick her off. Her nails dug into my chest. Her eyes glowed with hunger. Been a long time since I had a good meal. She growled. Her mouth opened wide, and I saw rows of pointed teeth, gleaming in the fading light. I screamed. Panic fueled a desperate burst of strength and I managed to buck her off long enough to scramble to my feet. She snarled, her body contorting in an inhuman way. I didn't wait for her next move. Back in the cab, my hands shook violently as I fumbled with the ignition. The truck lurched forward, and I glanced back just in time to see the woman, now a hulking, hunched figure, sprinting after me on all fours. She moved with terrifying speed, her animalistic cries echoing in the twilight. I floored the accelerator. The truck surged forward, gaining distance. But she kept coming, a monstrous blur gaining ground. I screamed again, a primal sound filled with terror. In the rearview mirror, I saw her leap. Her clawed hands slammed against the back window. Glass exploded inward, the impact throwing me forward against the steering wheel. My vision blurred, but through the swirling shards, I saw the creature pull itself into the truck bed. Frantically, I reached for the gear shift and floored the gas pedal, swerving the truck across both lanes. She would be thrown out, crushed on the lonely road. The impact never came. Through the rear window... I saw the inhuman woman scrambling on all fours across the cargo compartment, clinging to the side rails for dear life. My heart slammed against my ribs. With every wild swerve of my truck, I expected to hear the crunch of her body against the unrelenting asphalt. Yet she held on with unnatural tenacity. I glanced at the speedometer, pushing ninety, and she was still in my truck. Up ahead, the highway snaked around a sharp curve. My last chance. Gripping the wheel, I cranked it hard to the left. The tires screeched in protest as the eighteen-wheeler threatened to roll. Through the mirror, I saw her lurch sideways and, for a heart-stopping moment, her claws scraped at empty air. But she caught herself, her body twisting, and she regained her grip on the railing. Her eyes, filled with a chilling mix of fury and hunger, burned into mine. Desperation surged through me. I spotted the emergency brake lever, a last resort, but it was my only option. Grabbing it, I yanked with all my strength. The truck shuddered, fishtailing violently as the rear tires locked. The change was instantaneous. Caught off balance, the woman was wrenched from her handhold and sent tumbling across the cargo bed. She slammed into the back of the cab. 
I watched, horrified, as her body hurtled over the top of the trailer and disappeared from sight. I slumped back against the seat, chest heaving with exertion. Shaking uncontrollably, I pulled the truck over as gently as I could and stumbled outside. The ground swayed beneath my feet. My legs buckled, and I sank to my knees beside the highway, retching as the adrenaline drained from my system. All that remained was a streak of blood on the back of the cab. No body, no proof of the horrifying encounter. Just my frantic breaths echoing in the desolate silence. After what seemed like an eternity, I regained enough strength to pull myself back into the truck. I dialed 911, my voice rough, my explanation bordering on hysterical. Hours later, a state trooper arrived. He gave me a long, skeptical look as I recounted my story. I showed him the broken rear window, the blood stain, and the gashes along the metal siding. He searched the surrounding area but found nothing. His radio crackled with reports of other stranded vehicles along the highway, all empty. Eventually, the trooper sent me on my way, his final words a barely concealed accusation. Stress can do strange things to a mind, son. Best get some rest now. Sleep, however, proved elusive. When I finally drifted off, it wasn't into the peaceful oblivion of rest but a nightmare. In my dream, I was driving again, the road endless, the creature crouched on the roof of the cab, peering through the window with hungry eyes. I jerked awake with a blood-curdling scream, my heart pounding a frantic tattoo. I didn't return to that stretch of highway. Quit driving long hauls altogether and found a local route. No amount of money was worth the lingering fear and the constant sense of being watched. I saw her face in every dark shadow, her guttural growls in every rustle of the wind. I even tried to convince myself that what happened was a psychotic break, the figment of an overworked imagination. But deep down, I know what I saw. And I have to keep looking over my shoulder, checking the rearview mirror, constantly aware that those yellow, inhuman eyes could be lurking out there waiting for me to make just one wrong turn. In the aftermath, the disappearances along that stretch of highway continued. No trace was ever found of any victims, their fate swallowed by the vast Wyoming wilderness. The stories became local legends, whispers among truckers, warnings passed down over greasy diner coffee. They spoke of a monstrous creature that preyed on the isolated, a phantom of the long haul. And though I never again saw the woman who stalked me that night, I became a reluctant part of the tale. A stark reminder that even on the most familiar routes, in the heart of our vast country, there are stretches of darkness where the known world ends, and the shadows can hide things far more terrifying than anything we can imagine. My name is Everett Klein, and this happened to me back in the fall of 2008. Married for almost 18 years, two daughters, a mortgage, I'm your average Joe. Long-haul trucking keeps food on the table, but it's a lonely existence. Still, the open road has its pull and beats punching a clock in some factory. That particular run took me from Seattle down to southern Arizona, right along the border. I'd never driven this route before, and that stretch of interstate slicing through the Arizona desert takes bleak to a whole new level. It was late October, the days already crisp. I planned to spend the night in Flagstaff, maybe catch a few winks before pushing on to Phoenix. Around dusk, I rolled into a dusty gas station just south of Payson, Arizona one of those old-school places with a rusting sign and faded pumps. The guy working the counter, all scrawny neck and grease-stained overalls, eyed me as I filled up my tank. 
gave me a head nod and a place is slowing down for the night, which, translated, meant he'd be locking the doors soon. Figuring I could use a stretch and a hot meal, I pulled the truck around the back where there was a little diner attached to the station. Stepping inside, it felt like I'd walked into a different era. Worn vinyl booths, a cracked linoleum floor, the smell of stale coffee and fried food, it hit a nostalgic chord, reminded me of truck stops back when I was a kid riding with my dad. There were only a few other folks inside. An old couple hunched over their plates, a guy with a trucker hat and a worn denim jacket perched at the counter, twirling a toothpick between his teeth. I took an empty booth, and a waitress appeared almost immediately, her name tag reading Flo Middle-Aged, frizzy hair, and a resigned look in her eyes. "'What'll it be, honey?' she asked in a voice thick with years of cigarette smoke. I scanned the laminated menu. Meatloaf sounds good. Side of hash browns and a coffee black, if you please, I said. She jotted the order down on a notepad as I took in the scene. This place had a strange vibe to it, something off that I couldn't quite put my finger on. The other customers seemed frozen in time, the lighting dim. It was like a still photograph and I just didn't belong in it. Then, I caught sight of something in a grimy mirror behind the counter. A flicker of movement outside. A dark figure was lurking in the parking lot close to my truck. The figure crouched, peering into my truck's cab for just a moment before disappearing back into the shadows. A chill ran down my spine. Someone casing out my rig. But there hadn't been any other trucks at the gas station and the place was out in the middle of nowhere. Who would be interested in what I was hauling? A nagging unease settled upon me. My meatloaf arrived, steaming, along with a chipped mug of coffee. I took a sip, but my stomach churned with nerves. Something wasn't right with this whole situation. I needed to get back on the highway, away from this place and whoever had been watching me. Check, please! I called out, tossing a few bills onto the table. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the trucker at the counter get up. He caught my gaze and nodded in the direction of the door. Leaving already? Flo asked with a cocked eyebrow as I passed. Got a long night ahead, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. Outside, the air hung heavy, the silence pressing against my eardrums. Where had that figure gone? The trucker from the diner leaned against his rig, lighting a cigarette. I gave him a tense nod as I approached my truck. Before sliding into the driver's seat, I did a quick scan of the area. Empty lot, just a tumbleweed blowing across the cracked asphalt. Whatever unease gripped me, I pushed it down. It was likely just an oddball, maybe a local homeless guy. No reason to spook myself. As I climbed into the cab and flipped on the headlights, a sudden, sharp pain jolted through my foot. I yelped and looked down. There, embedded in the sole of my boot, was a shard of glass, glinting in the dim light. I swore under my breath and fumbled to pull the sliver out. My skin prickled, the feeling of being watched intensifying. It took me a moment to clear the glass from my soul, my fingers shaking slightly. That's when I saw the trucker again. He stood by his truck now, watching me intently. In the harsh glare of my headlights, he looked different, his features more angular, less human. His eyes held a strange intensity, unblinking. Then he gestured, motioning for me to follow. A wave of fear crashed over me. I'd seen his truck here earlier, figured he was just another driver passing through. But now, something about him was wrong. Survival instincts kicked in. I threw the truck into gear and peeled out of the gravel lot, the roar of the engine shattering the silence. 
Glancing in the rearview mirror, I saw the trucker's rig lurch forward in pursuit, headlights blazing in the desolate night. The adrenaline surged through me like an electric current as I pushed the truck to its limits. My heart hammered a frantic rhythm against my ribs, my vision narrowing to the stretch of highway illuminated ahead. Every jolt and rattle of my truck felt as if that relentless figure was one step closer. I had no idea where I was going, only that I had to get away. Images flashed across my mind, my wife, my girls, and the life I was desperately trying to get back to. Glancing in my side mirrors, the relentless headlights of his truck closed in, gaining with each passing mile. He knew this terrain, these desolate stretches of road, far better than I did. In this deadly chase, I was outmatched, and he knew it. Then up ahead I saw a glimmer of hope, a signpost indicating a dirt road cutting off from the highway. A potential escape route. With a desperate twist of the wheel, I veered off the main road, bouncing and jolting across the rough terrain. Dust choked the air, blurring my view. Every dip and bump threatened to send the truck careening out of control. The unrelenting beam of his headlights remained behind me, but dimmed slightly. Maybe, just maybe, I was gaining a small advantage. That hope was brutally extinguished when I saw the ravine looming before me. I slammed the brakes, tires screeching against dirt and rock. The truck skidded, then careened to a halt a mere foot from the sheer drop-off. I sat there, gasping for air my heart pounding a deafening beat in my ears. The sound of his truck grew closer. There was nowhere left to run. The driver's side door creaked open, and an overpowering stench washed over me, rotting meat mixed with something oily and metallic. My stomach revolted. I could hear heavy footsteps approaching as his figure stepped into the hazy pool of light cast by my headlights. He was tall, inhumanly tall, and lean with a wiry, muscular build. Filthy clothes hung off his gaunt frame, ripped in places to reveal grayish skin stretched taut over prominent bones. His face, that's what made my breath catch in my throat. Sunken cheeks, an emaciated jawline, yet his eyes bulged, filled with a predatory hunger. His lips were pulled back in a grotesque snarl, revealing a row of needle-like teeth, stained dark crimson. He lunged at me, and I recoiled, throwing up a desperate arm as he grabbed my shoulder. His grip was like iron. With a sickening ripping sound, my jacket tore. I struggled against him, his breath hot and rancid on my face. There was a flash of movement— had he brought something with him? A blade, some weapon? Then a searing pain shot through my leg. I screamed and kicked blindly, finally connecting. He staggered back, clutching at his face. My chance. I scrambled out of the driver's seat and onto the dirt, half crawling, half stumbling towards the edge of the ravine. It was pitch black beyond the drop. I couldn't see where I was going but it didn't matter. Anywhere was better than remaining in his clutches. A guttural growl echoed behind me as he regained his footing. I took a leap of faith and plunged into the abyss. The fall was brutal, a sickening mix of terror and tumbling blackness. Sharp rocks tore at my clothes, my skin. I braced for the inevitable impact that would splinter my bones— but the landing was cushioned by a tangle of dry brush. Still, the force knocked the wind from my lungs. Pain exploded through me as I tried to move, my leg twisted at an unnatural angle, nausea rising in my throat. It was broken, maybe worse. But I forced myself to crawl, dragging my mangled body through the dirt, every inch in agony. His footsteps echoed above, closer with each ragged breath I took. He'd find me soon enough, cornered like an animal. A sob tore from my throat. 
my girls would never see their dad again. Then I saw it, an outcropping of rock jutting from the ravine wall, forming a small, shadowy alcove. Desperation fueled me. I reached for a handhold, pulling myself up and into the crevice, shoving myself as far back as I could go. I curled into a ball, willing myself to disappear into the darkness. The footsteps stopped right above my hiding spot. He was there, breathing in ragged, frustrated pants. He knew I was close. I held my breath, tears streaming silently down my face. He started muttering to himself, his voice a chilling, guttural rasp. Words I didn't understand but the tone was enough to send shivers down my spine. Then, a thud, something heavy being dragged. A sickening wave of terror washed over me as I realized what he planned. I watched in horror as the bloodied bodies of the couple from the diner were tossed over the edge, landing with dull thumps below. My stomach heaved. He would do the same with me if he found me. The shuffling footsteps faded. Then, a low, rasping chuckle echoed off the ravine walls, making my blood run cold. He knew I was still out here somewhere. He was toying with me, waiting, savoring the hunt. The night stretched on endlessly. I drifted in and out of a painful stupor, the image of his monstrous form burned behind my eyelids. Morning painted the sky with pale light, and still— there was no sign of him. I waited for what felt like an eternity, every muscle tensed for the onslaught that never came. Inch by painful inch, I dragged myself out of my hiding place, the harsh daylight a brutal reminder of my plight. I don't remember much about what came next. The miles I crawled along the ravine, the eventual stumbling upon a remote road, the kind stranger who stopped their car at the sight of a bloodied, broken man, the events blurred together. The police came, the statements at the hospital, the faces of my wife and daughter streaked with tears. Reporters latched onto the story, dubbing him the Desert Ripper. They never found him. The incident irrevocably altered me, chipped away at the ordinary life I once led. The physical scars healed, but the nightmares linger. The endless stretch of deserted highway, his gaunt figure stalking me under the relentless desert sun. I'll never be the same easygoing trucker again. The fear sits in my gut, a permanent resident. Some nights, I think I hear the rumble of a truck engine outside, smell the rotting stench that clung to him. I wake in a cold sweat, my heart pounding, wondering if he's finally come back for me to finish the hunt he'd started on that desolate stretch of highway. My name is Derek Wyatt, and this happened to me back in September of 2016. I've been driving over the road for almost a decade, and I love it. Something about the solitude, the endless stretch of highway, gets in your blood, you know? Wife and kids understand it's my kind of freedom. That particular run took me out west, hauling a load of construction equipment from Indiana to Arizona. Nothing fancy, just doing my job. I had planned to make Flagstaff for the night, maybe grab a shower and a decent meal before pushing on south the next day. Then, the storm hit. Came out of nowhere, a wall of rain and wind that turned those flat stretches of New Mexico Highway into a slick, treacherous mess. Visibility went to zero, and I started to doubt my decision to keep pushing through the worst of it. It was just past dusk when I pulled off at one of those old, dusty rest areas. Seemed like the safest bet wait out the storm before getting back on the road. I didn't even unhook the trailer, just figured I'd hole up in the cab, watch a movie on my laptop, maybe catch some shut-eye. 
I should have listened to that nagging sense of unease pricking at the back of my mind. There was something off about that rest area, a desolate kind of silence broken only by the howling wind. But I shrugged it off, attributing it to the weather, the sheer emptiness of the place. Through the rain-streaked windshield, I noticed a car, the only other vehicle in the lot. An old sedan, faded blue, dented and rust-spotted. It just sat there, engine idling, headlights off, like it was waiting for something. Probably some other traveler who got spooked by the storm like me. Didn't think much of it. A couple of hours later, the rain started to ease. I figured the worst had passed, and I could safely get back on the road. That's when I saw him outside the truck, standing in the faint glow of the rest area lights. He'd come out of nowhere. At first glance, he seemed ordinary enough, just some guy, slightly hunched, maybe a bit older. Then he turned towards me, and I caught a clear view of his face in the harsh artificial light. It's hard to explain the feeling that washed over me, a mix of ice-cold fear and revulsion. His skin looked stretched too thin over jutting bones, almost translucent, with a sickly greenish tinge to it. His eyes were sunken hollows, but they held a malevolent gleam under those bushy eyebrows. And the grin, it was like a parody of a human smile, too wide, too many teeth. Teeth stained black. I froze, one hand on the ignition, every instinct screaming at me to hit the gas. My fingers fumbled for the gear shift, ready to peel out of there when he moved. It was an unnatural movement, a lurching step that brought him right up to my window with surprising speed. My heart hammered like it would break through my ribs. He leaned down, peering into the cab, and I recoiled in my seat. His breath washed over me in a stale wave, smelling of rotting meat and something chemical. With a trembling hand, I rolled up the window, separating myself from him by a thin sheet of glass. He tapped the glass with one long, bony finger, the nail yellowed and cracked. That mocking grin was still plastered on his face. Even through the rain-streaked glass, I saw a dark stain on his shirt, a splatter pattern that made my stomach turn. Then he spoke. His voice was a hoarse rasp, barely more than a whisper, yet it seemed to cut through the rain and the rumble of my idling engine. You shouldn't be here, he said. It wasn't a warning, more like a flat statement of fact. Fear turned to anger then, and I found the courage to speak. What's it to you, old man? I snapped back, trying to sound tougher than I felt. His grin widened, but his eyes remained dead and cold. As he opened his mouth again, I saw something glint in the darkness between his cracked lips. A shard of bone, maybe? A jolt of adrenaline propelled me out of my paralysis. I threw the truck into gear, ignoring the screech of tires against wet pavement and the lurch as the rig moved forward. The rest area disappeared in my rearview mirror, and I saw his figure shrinking in the distance. I didn't stop until I hit the next town, a nameless blur of neon somewhere on the outskirts of Albuquerque. I found a brightly lit gas station and pulled in, needing coffee, needing to put distance between myself and that desolate rest area haunted by the figure who looked too gaunt, too strange to be fully human. I walked toward the brightly lit convenience store, but a flicker in the corner of my eye brought me up short. Parked among the other cars was the old blue sedan, dented and rusted. How in the world had it followed me? Panic rose like a tide, drowning out all rational thought. I turned and ran back to my truck, scrambling inside and locking the doors. Through the windshield, I saw him standing near the gas pumps, watching me. He knew. He knew I had seen him, seen him for the monstrous thing he truly was. And deep down, I knew he wouldn't let me go easily. He'd hunt me, 
relentless in his pursuit. He lifted one bony hand and pointed directly at me. His lips moved, forming silent words. Not for long, it looked like. Then, he lowered his hand, turned, climbed into the old car, and disappeared into the highway traffic just as mysteriously as he'd appeared. The encounter turned me inside out. I went from being a no-nonsense trucker to a jumpy wreck, constantly checking my mirrors, jolting awake at every sound in the night. The image of his ghastly face haunted my dreams. I pushed through to Arizona, delivered the load, and hightailed it back east. I tried to convince myself it was over, that the old freak was just some desert recluse who didn't appreciate strangers. But that deep-seated fear gnawed at me, a sense of unfinished business. He'd threatened me, and I knew he wasn't the type to let it slide. Days turned into weeks. The dread dulled slightly, replaced by a grim determination. I wouldn't hide. If that monstrous figure decided to track me down, I'd make damn sure he regretted the decision. I bought a gun practiced at a range until I could hit a target with some accuracy. I wasn't a killer by nature, but self-defense was another story. It turned out, I didn't need to search for him. He came for me. It was a routine pickup, a load of furniture from Ohio to Virginia. Nothing that should have set off alarm bells. I stopped at a roadside diner in eastern Pennsylvania one of those places with worn checkered tablecloths and waitresses who called you Han. A truck stop special and a strong black coffee seemed like the cure for bone-deep weariness. As I slid into a vinyl booth, something flickered at the edge of my vision. It was parked in the far corner of the lot, half obscured by a faded delivery van. The old blue sedan. Ice water seemed to flood my veins, and a strangled gasp escaped my throat. He'd found me. Had he been following me all this time? I fought back the panic and tried to think rationally. Maybe this was just coincidence. Maybe some other poor bastard owned the same rust bucket. I'd stay alert, watch him, but I wouldn't spook myself. I ordered my meal, taking deliberately slow bites so I could keep the parking lot in view. The food sat like a lead weight in my stomach as my eyes scanned the lot. He didn't appear. Maybe he didn't realize it was me. A sliver of hope flickered. I could just finish my meal, slip out, and be miles down the road before he even noticed. As the waitress refilled my coffee, a sudden movement caught my eye. He stepped out of the shadows, moving toward the diner's entrance with that same unnatural lurching walk. There was no mistaking him now, not that sickly, greenish pallor or those dead, predatory eyes under the bushy brows. He looked right at me, and that chilling grin split his face. It was deliberate, a taunt, a message that said he knew exactly who I was and that escape was impossible. The gun was holstered under my jacket. I could draw it, maybe get off a clean shot in self-defense before anyone realized what was happening. A public place like this, there would be witnesses, police involvement. Yet something held me back. Some primal instinct whispered that a shootout wouldn't solve anything. That if I'd pulled that trigger, it linked me to him forever, dragged me into his shadowy world. Instead, I threw some cash on the table and walked out. Every step felt heavy, his gaze burning into my back. The diner door slammed behind me, a jarring counterpoint to the pounding of my heart. I walked toward the truck, my hands shaking, trying to project an air of calm while my mind raced. I had to disappear. Slip out before he expected, find some backroad route he wouldn't anticipate. As I slid behind the wheel... A flicker of movement in my rearview mirror made me slam on the brakes. He sat in the passenger seat of my truck, the door hanging open. 
With impossible speed, he'd crossed the lot and somehow gotten inside without me noticing. That grotesque parody of a grin was inches from my face now. The stench of rot and chemicals washed over me like a suffocating wave. Trying to hide? He wheezed, and I saw the dark stain on his shirt was blood, not some random spill. Fresh blood. A chill slithered down my spine as a horrifying thought took shape. This wasn't about some random trucker who'd glimpsed his true nature. This was about the hunt, the thrill of cornering his prey. A glint of light winked off something in his hand, something small, metallic. A bone fragment, sharp and jagged, stained with something far too red to be rust. My vision swam, my stomach heaved. My survival instincts, so sharp just moments before, crumpled in on themselves in the face of pure, monstrous terror. I'm no hero, and in that moment, all I could manage was a strangled cry as he lunged. The local news was filled with the gruesome story. Trucker found dead in his cab, a savage assault unlike any they'd seen before. My wife, my kids, their faces etched with shock and grief as they tried to understand the senselessness of it all. The investigation dragged on without results, no clues, no witnesses. They labeled the killer, the road ripper, and sightings popped up all over. Truckers whispering over CB radios about a blue sedan seen tailing a big rig, or a gaunt figure lurking at rest areas. Some stories were probably fueled by fear and the power of suggestion, but some, some sent a fresh wave of terror through me. I knew deep down he was still out there. The police said I was unlucky, a random victim. But I know the truth. That monstrous figure didn't just attack me. He chose me. He singled me out for the twisted thrill of the chase, for the sport of it. And what makes it truly terrifying is, I know he's still hunting. He's still out there. Somewhere on the endless stretch of highways... That blue sedan is lurking, just waiting for its next victim. My name is Brecken, Brecken Mayer, and this happened to me in the spring of 1991. I still drive. Got back into this life after a rough few years but the road feels different after what I saw. Sometimes I wonder if I ever really left it at all. It was my first time taking I-40 through the high plains of New Mexico. Usually stuck to the southern routes, I tend to I-20 kinda guy. But a last-minute offer came in for a load of produce headed up to Denver, and the pay was too good to pass on. Should have known better than to take a new route at night. The sun had barely dipped below the horizon when I noticed the car. Just a flicker of reflected light off a twisted bumper a ways up the shoulder. I thought about stopping, offering help if I could, but I was behind schedule as it was. I figured some other kind soul would come along soon enough. Miles passed by. The desert night had that deep, empty quiet. Kind that makes a man start hearing things that aren't there. Then I saw it again, the same crumpled car, up ahead on the right. I frowned, doing a double take there was no way I'd pass that stretch of road twice. A trickle of unease snaked down my spine. I slowed the truck, debating whether to just pull over and take a look. Whatever this was, it wasn't sitting right with me. That's when I saw the man. He was standing a few yards away from the car, silhouetted against the twilight. There was something odd about the way he held himself. Too stiff, shoulders squared like a soldier at attention. I hit my brakes, bringing the semi to a grumbling halt. Hey, you need some help? I yelled out the open window, but he didn't react. Seemed like he hadn't even heard me. My unease was growing by the second, 
but damned if I was going to leave someone stranded out here in the dark. I got out of the truck. The night air was surprisingly cool against my skin. As I got closer to the man, I saw the reason for his odd stance. He was wearing a damn suit. A nice one, looked like wool, the kind you wear to a funeral or a fancy job interview. But out here, in the middle of nowhere, with that wrecked car at his feet, it didn't make any sense. Mr. You all right? I closed the gap a little more. That's when I saw his face. I stopped in my tracks. Not because of any blood or gore his face was perfectly fine. It was the color that got me. Pale as death in the fading light, with lips tinged a strange shade of blue. His eyes were open, staring straight ahead, glassy and unblinking. The closer I got, the worse it was. His suit hung loose on his body, like there was barely enough left inside to hold it up. Then I noticed the smell. Faint but foul, like old meat starting to turn. I don't scare easy, but fear shot through me like lightning. I turned to run, but it was too late. The man moved, not like any human I'd ever seen. It was a jerky, lurching motion, as if his limbs were being pulled by unseen wires. In the space of a heartbeat, he closed the distance between us. His hands were ice cold when they clamped around my throat, his fingers unnaturally long and bony. There was surprising strength in that withered frame. He lifted me clean off my feet. I kicked and struggled, but it was useless. My vision swam, spots dancing in front of my eyes. In the last shreds of my fading consciousness, I registered a detail I'd missed earlier. The man's eyes had rolled back in his head, leaving only the whites visible. Then the world went black. I came to with a ragged gasp, my lungs burning. I lay on the cold asphalt, the night sky swirling above me. The man was gone. My neck throbbed where he had grabbed me, the skin already turning an angry purple. I stumbled to my feet, half running, half falling back to the truck. I fumbled for the keys, hands trembling. I got the engine started and roared back onto the highway, putting as much distance as I could between myself and that that thing wearing a dead man's clothes. I didn't stop again until I reached Albuquerque. The second I crossed the city limits, I found a motel, bolted myself into a room, and drank myself to sleep. In the harsh light of the morning, I tried to convince myself it was a nightmare, a hallucination brought on by too many hours behind the wheel. But the bruises on my neck were real, and that awful stench lingered in my nostrils. I called the New Mexico State Police from a payphone, told them about the wrecked car, figured they'd at least go find the poor bastard who'd been inside, give him a proper send-off. The dispatcher seemed oddly hesitant, though, asking me to describe the location again, and then to describe the man I had seen. I don't know how long I waited on hold. The sun was dipping low when the dispatcher finally came back on the line. Her voice was strained, a tightness to it now that hadn't been there before. Sir, we, we don't have any reports of an accident along that stretch of I-40. Nobody matching your description of the man either. There was a long silence. I tried to find the words, to explain how it was possible, what I had seen with my own eyes. Sir, the dispatcher continued, her voice barely above a whisper. Are you sure? Are you sure he was alive? My gut clenched. The question echoed the fears that had been gnawing at me since I woke in that empty parking lot. I wanted to scream that he hadn't been alive, couldn't have been. But the memory of his icy fingers on my throat, the unnatural strength in his skeletal form, refused to be denied. I don't know. I choked out, the admission scratching at my throat. It didn't seem. 
The dispatcher cut me off gently. Sir, I'm going to give you a number. It's for an agent. He specializes in unusual cases. She hesitated. Look, maybe this was nothing. Maybe it was like you said, a bad dream. But it's best if you talk to him. Let him decide, okay? Numbly, I agreed, taking down the number and promising to call. After hanging up, I sat on the dingy motel bed, the springs creaking in protest, and stared at the scrap of paper in my hand. I should have called the agent right then. Should have swallowed my pride and admitted I'd been spooked by shadows and loneliness. But something held me back. It was the absurdity of it all, the impossibility of what I had seen. And beneath that, a simmering anger. I wasn't crazy. I knew what I saw, and damned if I was going to let some stranger in a suit tell me otherwise. I left Albuquerque early the next morning, determined to put the whole unsettling episode behind me. The miles rolled by under a cloudless sky, the weight of the past few days easing with each passing state line. By the time I reached Denver, I was feeling almost like my old self. Then, on my return trip, I saw him again. He was standing in broad daylight this time, near a cracked and weathered billboard advertising a long-abandoned tourist trap. That same unnatural stillness, that god-awful stench wafting on the desert breeze. My blood ran cold. Panic surged, but beneath it was a desperate need to know, to understand what in God's name was going on. I pulled over, truck rumbling to a stop on the sandy shoulder. My legs felt like lead as I got out, each step bringing me closer to the thing in the suit. Up close, the details were even worse. His skin had the waxy sheen of a corpse, and there were dark stains around his mouth, like dried blood. Yet his eyes, those milky, lifeless eyes, still tracked my movement with chilling precision. Who are you? My voice sounded weak, pathetic to my own ears. What do you want? A flicker of something passed across his face. It looked almost like amusement. He tilted his head slightly, like a bird eyeing a worm. Then, in a raspy croak that didn't seem possible given how hollowed out his chest looked, he spoke. One word. Follow. He turned and walked away, his lurching gait carrying him across the sun-baked sand towards a line of ragged foothills. I hesitated, every ounce of common sense screaming at me to run, to forget I had ever seen this creature. Yet my feet seemed to have a will of their own. I stumbled after him, a moth drawn to a deadly flame. He led me for hours deeper into the desolate landscape. The sun beat down mercilessly, my mouth dry, my throat parched. But there was no stopping. It was as if he held me on an invisible chain, compelling me to follow. Finally, as dusk painted the sky in hues of blood and fire, he stopped before a narrow crevice in the rocks. The opening was barely visible, a dark gash in the weathered stone an icy tendril of fear twisted in my gut. The figure turned, those empty eyes boring into mine. In that raspy voice, he spoke again. Wait. Then, he squeezed himself through the gap in the rock and vanished into the darkness. I stood there, heart pounding in my ears, unable to move. The rational part of me, the part that clung stubbornly to sanity, begged me to leave while I still could. But the rest of me, the part drawn inexorably into the growing shadows, knew it was too late. As the last sliver of sunlight disappeared, I took a shuddering breath and stepped into the crevice. The blackness was absolute, smothering. The stale air, heavy with the smell of decay and damp earth, made my stomach churn. I fumbled through my pockets, found the small flashlight I always kept stashed in the glove box, and flicked it on. The beam of light cut through the darkness, revealing a narrow, 
twisting passageway. The walls were slick with moisture, jagged rocks jutting out at odd angles. I edged forward, my boots slipping on the damp floor. The passage seemed to go on forever, the silence broken only by my own ragged breathing and the echo of dripping water. The beam of the flashlight danced eerily ahead, snatching glimpses of glistening rock and unsettling shadows that seemed to shift and writhe at the edge of my vision. Then I saw it. A soft glow ahead, pulsing faintly in the heart of the darkness. My exhausted mind screamed at me to turn back, but my feet carried me relentlessly onward. The passage opened into a large cavern. My flashlight wasn't enough to illuminate the full extent of the space, but it did reveal the source of the glow. Bones. They were everywhere, piled high against the walls, scattered across the damp cavern floor. Human bones, weathered and bleached. And amidst that sea of death, there were figures. Dozens of them, dressed in tattered suits, their pale skin gleaming in the dim light. They swayed slightly, their empty eyes fixed on a point in the center of the cavern. As I drew closer, my flashlight shaking in my hand, I saw what held their attention. It was a hole in the earth, a jagged pit plunging into darkness deeper than the night itself. And within the pit, amidst the flicker of strange green flames, stood the man I had followed here. Only, he wasn't alone. In his bony fists, he held a struggling figure. Someone barely dressed in rags, their form skeletal and gaunt. Yet there was a flicker of life in their eyes, a desperation that burned even in this place of death and decay. The man in the suit raised the figure high above his head, the green flames casting monstrous shadows that danced across the cavern walls. A chant began to rise from the suited figures around me a low, guttural moan that vibrated in my very bones. My mind was reeling. A cult, it had to be. But what kind of sick ritual was this? The man in the suit tilted his head back, exposing his desiccated throat, and uttered a single, chilling word. Release. He hurled the struggling figure into the flaming pit. A heart-rending scream echoed in the cavern quickly cut off as the flames consumed the helpless victim. The moan from the suited figures grew louder, their swaying movements becoming more frenzied. And for the first time since my nightmare began, I saw a change in the man in the suit. His pale skin seemed to flush, the hollows of his cheeks filling out. In the flickering green light, it was almost as if he was becoming more. That's when I finally broke. I turned and ran, blind terror propelling me back through the twisting passage. The chanting pursued me, relentless and horrifying. Stumbling and gasping for breath, I burst back out into the fading twilight. I didn't stop running until I reached the highway. I flagged down the first car that passed, babbling my story to the terrified driver. They took me to the nearest town, where I stumbled into the sheriff's office and begged for help. The response was, not what I expected. No sirens, no flood of police vehicles converging on the desolate spot I had described. Instead, I got weary looks and quiet questions about my state of mind. The name of the FBI agent the dispatcher had given me hovered unspoken in the room. They told me exhaustion and dehydration had gotten the better of me. They told me I'd hallucinated the whole thing, brought on by stress and too many nights alone on the road. Maybe they even believed it. Maybe it was the easier answer. I didn't argue. I left the station and found the nearest motel, chaining the doors shut and hiding under the covers like a scared child. That's where they found me two days later. Wasn't the local police, though. It was two men in dark suits, the FBI agent's number clutched in my sweaty hand. They sat me down, their faces grim, and laid it all out. Turns out, 
I wasn't the first to have this kind of encounter. It stretched back decades. Truckers, hikers, unfortunate souls who stumbled upon hidden corners of the desert where things ain't what they seem. There was even a name for the creature I had seen, whispered in hushed tones by those who knew. A skin taker, they called it. The agents, they weren't sure exactly what it was. Some leftover remnant of old, dark religions, a parasite feeding on human misery, they had theories but no real answers. What they did know was how it operated. It found the broken, the desperate, those on the verge of giving up. It offered them something. A deal, a twisted kind of salvation, and the price was always paid in the suffering of others. I asked them what happened to the people who followed it, the ones I saw in the cave. The agents exchanged a grim look. They change, was all they would say. My life unraveled after that. The FBI kept tabs on me for a while making sure I wasn't a danger to myself or others, or maybe that I wasn't going to start talking to every tabloid journalist with a checkbook. Eventually, they faded away, leaving me to grapple with the fractured pieces of my sanity. I never went back to long-haul trucking. Couldn't stand the thought of those empty stretches of highway, the knowledge of what might lurk just out of sight. Found a job as a dispatcher instead, my voice on the radio a lifeline for the men and women still out there on the road. Nights are the hardest. The image of that flaming pit, the desperate eyes of the victim, it haunts my dreams. Sometimes I think I see him, that man in the suit, and the crowds on the street. A flash of unnatural pallor, a flicker of empty eyes, and my heart seizes in my chest. I tell myself it's the trauma— the nightmare's twisting reality. But deep down, I know the truth. He's still out there, and others like him. They walk among us, hidden in plain sight, preying on sorrow and regret. And every time the phone rings in the dim light of the dispatch office, I pray that it's not another lonely driver calling for help, calling for a salvation that's worse than any kind of death.